Legacy, Next Generation Academy of Ancients Book 8, written by Avery Cross, narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Chapter 1, Jack. Gone. The Dagger of Vitality, the only magical item that could lift the curse, was gone. How had this happened? How? A nightmare. This had to be another nightmare. I'd been so close to finally being free of the pain and the death sentence hanging over my head. Now, there was nothing. But that was a powerful artifact. Not much could have destroyed it. Had I done it somehow? What just happened? Nyala whispered. I don't understand. Why was it glowing like that? Briar asked. I'm not sure any of that was meant to happen, Luke added. It wasn't, I snapped, and flames flickered to life at my fingertips. They quickly coiled up my arms and laid over my shoulders. There was only one explanation for how tonight had gone from my salvation to letting me know how screwed I really was. Erickson, that bitch! The fire reared up at my words. Jack? Nyala took a step closer, but I pushed off the couch and stormed out of reach. My fire continued to grow and pulse around me in perfect sync with my heartbeat. The room vanished, and all I could see were walls of orange and red. She'd done it. Erickson had managed to take everything away from me, including the hope that I'd survive this curse. I was gonna die, and Nyala would be forced to watch. Chance and Gabriel and Erickson would get to live on to carry out whatever nefarious plans they had and I'd be dead and rotting in the ground, right alongside my parents. What if those bastards didn't stop there? What if they came after the newfound family I'd created? What if they came after Nyala, and I wasn't here to protect her? I closed my hands into fists, a swell of heat rose inside me, ready to turn into an inferno that was going to burn out of control. If I only had so much time left, I had to leave Silent Heights. There was no waiting around for some miracle to save me. I'd use what time I had left and hunt Chance down. If I was going to die, I was taking him with me. The flames climbed higher while they swirled around me like a cyclone. The faintest flicker of blue appeared amongst the raging hues. A gentle touch of cold, as if snowflakes were falling on my face, pushed through the fire. The touch spread, feeling like hands holding my cheeks. It moved to my shoulders and held me close, even as fire threatened to consume everything in its path. Without looking, I sensed the cold touch turning into frost, felt the patterns forming over my skin and moving down my arms, covering my chest and shifting to my back. Little by little, the fire calmed enough that I could see through the flames. Standing right in front of me, her eyes the palest blue and reflecting icy patterns of their own, was Nyala. She raised her hand toward me and waited. With the fire still roaming over me, I took hold of that hand. I pulled her to me. The fire completely retreated once she was in my embrace. She hugged me hard, and the last of the flames turned to embers. They ignited the frost covering us, like watching a fire through a wall of ice. We'll find another way, she said firmly. We will. I kissed the top of her head, amazed once again at how her optimism had no end. Is this Erickson woman that powerful? Briar asked, once Nyala and I had turned around to face them all. I mean, that dagger was old, right? It was, but Erickson had been collecting power for the last thirty or so years, I told her. She finds artifacts, and if they're not useful to her, she drains the power that's held inside them, then keeps the items as trophies. She must have done that with the dagger. The notion sounded crazy once I'd said it aloud. To destroy an artifact as ancient as the dagger would have taken an immense amount of magic. But who was to say she didn't have that much at her disposal? So it was a trap then, Zack muttered, distracting me from that train of thought. If it was a trap, why didn't Erickson set one that would have captured Jack? Nyala asked. Why let him escape? because this was what she wanted. I glared at the remains of the dagger lying on the floor by the couch. She's a cruel woman. She wanted me to think there was hope. She wanted me to believe I had a future. 
Then she wanted it to be yanked away. She did this, knowing it'd break me. But it didn't, Nyala argued. It hasn't. Nyala, I murmured, softly kissing her lips. There's no other way to remove the curse. You've studied them as I have. Curses are complicated. Try to break one without knowing the intricacies of the magic used to cast it, and it'll backfire. And this one that has me is old. It's been around for centuries. There's no record of the magic used to create it, only what it does and the one sure way to break it. The pile of dust mocked me while I glowered at it. We weren't even 100% sure the dagger would work. It was just a hope. And now that's gone. There's no other way, I repeated. Yes, there is, she insisted, even as I shook my head. We just haven't found it yet. She held my face and stared into my eyes. I'm not giving up yet, so you don't get to either. She's right, Briar said. We haven't heard back from most of the people we reached out to about the curse. There's bound to be someone out there who has information on it. Zack and his brothers were nodding right along with her. All I could think was how insane they were. This was the end of me. Why would none of them admit that? You're right, I heard myself say, mostly because I knew it was the only thing that would let me walk out of this room. I let go of Nyala and stepped back. I need a minute. She didn't argue, though I saw the struggle in her eyes to follow me in case I tried to do something stupid. I leaned in long enough to kiss her with the silent promise that I wasn't leaving, then strode down the hall to the bedroom. Once I was shut inside and alone, I sank straight to my knees and let the fire flow. Angry tears turned to sparks and slipped down my cheeks. The despair I'd been holding back burst out of me in waves of red flames. They flooded the room, then curled back on themselves and crashed into me. How was I supposed to believe there was any sort of future for me now? How was I supposed to keep going on, knowing that soon enough, my days would come to an end? No potion would be able to hold back the curse forever. It didn't matter what Nyala had said. Erickson had broken me. I'd failed to avenge my parents' murders. I'd failed to stop Erickson and Gabriel from hurting any more innocents. I'd failed to save my brother, then failed to stop him when he became a traitor. Eventually, the flames settled and burned out. Shifting on the floor, I pressed my back to the wall. I pulled my knees up and let a single tiny flame dance from one hand to the other. My idea to hunt down Chance was a stupid one. I knew that. In the state I was in, I'd be lucky to get close, let alone have enough strength left in me to kill him. I kept my eyes on the tiny flame. It morphed into various shapes before settling on a songbird. Its wings fluttered, and it let out the softest of chirps. Mom had always loved creating birds with her fire, and Dad would make wind currents for them to zoom around the house on. The bird landed atop my knee, tilting its head as if studying me. What are you looking at, huh? I whispered. I'm nothing but a dead man walking. The bird chirped louder this time and flew off toward the ceiling. It spun around and then dove straight for my chest. The second it made contact, I could have sworn I heard Mom's voice in my mind. You're a scud. You don't get to give up. There's a way. Find it. Warmth bloomed throughout my body, comforting and familiar. A subtle breeze ruffled my hair next. Dad. It shouldn't have been possible, but somehow, they were here. And they were right. I was a Scot, and a Scot didn't quit. Revenge on chance would have to wait, but there was somewhere else I needed to be. Getting up off the floor, I went to the closet pulled out my duffel bag, and started to pack. Chapter 2. Nyala The bedroom door closed with a thud that seemed far louder than it actually was. Are you okay? Briar asked. No, I admitted. How can I be? I'd gone from being furious at Jack for taking off as he had to find the dagger on his own, then I'd been elated that he'd returned in one piece and with a dagger in hand. To say my emotions were all over the place was a vast understatement. What if this does him in? What if I can't keep him from slipping? You just don't let him give up, Briar said. And you don't give up either. What are we supposed to do now? 
That dagger was it. And as much as I hadn't wanted to say it in front of Jack, a part of me knew he was right. Finding another way to break the curse was going to be nearly impossible. Even if we tried to break apart the magic that created it, that could take months, maybe even years. And Jack didn't have those to spare. Give us time. Nick held up his hand at the look I gave him. I know we don't have much, but we'll make sure he's got a decent batch of potions to counteract the symptoms and we'll keep looking. We'll reach out to a few more people. Something will turn up. And we'll get our best minds on the job of trying to pick this curse apart. Maybe we'll get lucky, Luke added, and he sighed. Though we'll have to be careful now who we talk to. If Erickson knew Jack was coming for the blade, there's a chance she's got eyes on him. Probably had him being watched this whole time. That's awesome, I muttered. Should they even go back to campus? Briar asked. I hadn't even thought of that. Would this General Erickson come for Jack at Academy? Did she already know that's where he was? And if she'd had eyes on him this whole time, that meant she had to know about me by now, too. Was I in danger? Were the others, since they'd been in contact with him? How far would this woman go to ensure Jack didn't survive the curse? Nyala? Briar took hold of my frost-covered hand. Hey, just breathe, okay? It's gonna be fine. You're going to be fine. I hadn't even realized I'd been breathing so quickly. I forced myself to calm down before I did lose control. Me? I'm not worried about me, I said, and I meant it. I thought at first it was anxiety and fear creeping back in to take over, but that wasn't what I felt rushing through me right then. It was anger. If Erickson was coming for Jack, I wasn't going to simply stand aside and let her have him. I'd nearly let the cultist win, even after they were dead, but I wasn't going to be pushed into that darkness so easily this time. I wasn't going to let fear get the better of me. I squeezed Briar's hand, trying to convey that I wasn't about to have a full mental breakdown. I should take Jack somewhere he'll be safe, where we can keep a better eye on him. We have several safe houses, Nick informed me. Talk to him and let us know what you decide in the morning. Where are you two going? Briar asked. Take care of our to-do list, Luke replied with a dark look in his eyes that didn't bode well for someone tonight. Not for the first time I was glad the Pierce brothers were on my side. Take care of Jack. Call us in the morning. And someone will deliver a fresh batch of potions then, too. Nick hugged me, followed by Luke. They exchanged a glance with Zack I couldn't read. Then they were out the door. Do you want us to leave, too? Briar asked. No, you can stay. Take the other bedroom. Jack won't care. My gaze drifted over the living room and landed on the pile of dust that had once been the dagger of vitality. Why had I been such an idiot to believe it'd be that easy? Briar giving me a gentle nudge toward the hallway stopped my thoughts from getting any worse. Go check on Jack. We'll get that cleaned up. I didn't bother arguing, knowing I'd lose. When I passed Zack, I laid my hand on his arm. Thanks for watching out for Jack tonight. Tell your brothers I said the same. If you guys hadn't been tracking him and gone in with him? The rest of the words wouldn't come. Zack covered my hand with his and smiled. Whether he likes it or not, he's sort of family now. I laughed and thanked Zack again. He was right. Jack wasn't going to get rid of any of us easily. Taking a deep breath, I made my way down the hall to the bedroom on the left. The door was closed. I pressed my hand to it feeling the heat of Jack's fire burning on the other side. Whether it was still going, I wasn't able to tell. I knocked first, waiting for him to reply. When all I got was silence, I tried the knob, surprised to find it unlocked. Jack? I stepped further into the room, then froze. He stood beside the bed. A duffel sat atop it, and he was shoving clothes into it by the handful. Disbelief quickly turned into anger. I stormed toward him and pushed him away from the bag he'd been filling. What are you doing, huh? Are you insane? You're just going to up and leave again? Two bright red flames burned in his eyes. Nyala. No, I don't want to hear it. You have got to stop taking off like this. Haven't you figured it out by now? You're not alone. And I'm not going to stand by and let you walk out that door to do shit I don't even know. I rambled. The flames in his eyes turned crimson, and it hit me hard enough that I staggered back a step. Seriously? That's what your plan is? 
I haven't even gotten to say anything, he pointed out. The slight amusement in his tone angered me even more. How is this funny? I know what you're doing. You think that the dagger's gone, so you're going to go after Chance, is that it? You're going to spend whatever time you have left hunting down your brother? How much of an idiot are you? At my words, the magic exploded out of me. Drops of frost hung in the air throughout the room. It was like we'd been tossed into a snow globe that someone had shaken up, then frozen in time. Jack's eyes widened, his gaze shifted to me, and the flames in his eyes burned a different shade of red. Not angry this time, far from it. He reached for my hands. I resisted for a second. He tugged on them again and I went to him. He raised his hands. When he tenderly cupped my cheeks and pressed his warm lips to my cold ones, I melted into him. I know trying to run from you is pointless, he whispered. I'll admit the notion of going after chance crossed my mind, but that's not what I'm doing. No? Then why are you packing? Jack's hands fell to my shoulders. They slid down my arms, then to my hands, leaving delicate flames in their wake. They danced along my skin, warming me. If there's any other way to break this curse, I'm not going to sit around and wait for someone else to find it. So you are leaving. Would you let me finish? He said with a laugh. I'm going home, Nyella. Home? Jack hadn't been home since his parents' murder. Why? I asked. If there's any information on another item like the dagger or the curse or something that might miraculously help us, it's bound to be in my parents' collection. Gabriel cleaned out the vault that night, but for the most part, their research and their collection of documents and books remained untouched. And, he added, nodding more to himself than me, it's time. I've been away too long. The Pierce brothers were thinking you probably shouldn't return to Academy anyway, I told him. Not until they figure out if Erickson is watching you. They mentioned something about a safe house. As long as that safe house is my family's home, I'll go. Great. I'm coming with you. I braced for the argument. Instead, Jack pulled me into his arms and kissed me. His fire surrounded us in thin ribbons of warmth and comfort. The drops of frost in the air gave off a soft, luminescent glow around us. We moved back to the bed. Jack reached behind him, tossed the duffel on the floor, and we sank into it in a laughing heap. I ended up lying atop him while he ran his fingers through my hair. They slipped to my jaw, then under my chin, gently bringing me to him again for a kiss that curled my toes. There was so much I wanted to say to him right then, but words seemed so pointless when I was in his arms. I kissed him again, pressing my lips to his, and finally let go of how terrified I'd been that he might not have come back to me tonight. Winding his arms around me, he rolled us over. His lips left a path of fire from my jaw to my neck. When his hand slipped up under my shirt, I sent a tiny burst of frost at the door to ensure it was locked. Shouldn't we talk about tomorrow? I murmured, loving how his hands felt pressed to bare skin. His touch tickled my ribs, and I bit my lip, never wanting him to stop. We will, tomorrow, he whispered. I laughed with him and let us have this moment. Chapter 3 Jack The long, winding drive to the Scott home in southeastern Tennessee was just as I remembered it. The road was lined with imposing evergreens that towered over the SUV. Each was covered in a fine layer of freshly fallen snow that glistened in the light of the moon. The moment we turned off the main road and hit gravel, the power that had been part of this property for generations had rushed over and through me. Home. I was finally home. The forest of evergreens eventually parted, and there, sprawled out before us, was the two-story home my parents had built. It had started as a small cabin built by my mom's side way back when. Each generation had added a room here or there, but with my parents' work, they needed the extra space. Unlike the Morris estate, which had a more compact feel to it, the Scott home was very ramshackle and spread out. Where the new additions were was obvious from the change in building materials or how the color of the stone changed from one wall to the next. The weathering varied, giving away how much newer some of the wings were, or how it switched from stone to brick to wood. The roof shingles were mismatched too, as were the styles of windows and trim. It was like someone had taken bits and pieces from various houses and smashed them all together. 
Man, I'd really missed this place. Way more than I'd realized. Nyala leaned forward in the passenger seat, her eyes alight and a smile on her face. You never said how big this place was. It's unique. I chuckled. Dad joked that it was the ugliest mansion ever to come into existence. No, not ugly. It certainly has character, though. Nyala continued to grin while I pulled the car up toward the main doors that resided beneath a tiled roof overhang. Trellising created makeshift walls on either side of the expansive porch. In the spring, they were usually covered with bright orange and red blooms. Now, they were nothing but dead vines in much need of attention. Everywhere I looked, the signs of neglect were there. Flower pots that were usually overflowing with life, even in the winter thanks to Mom's magic, were filled with dried-out skeletons of shrubs. The herb garden to the right that stretched around toward the rear of the house where the kitchen was had become vastly overgrown. The wooden fence had buckled in places. That garden had been Dad's pride and joy. Now it was a blight on the property. If this was how the outside looked, how terrible was the inside? The SUV came to a stop, but I couldn't get myself to let go of the steering wheel to put the vehicle in park. The engine idled. A minute went by. Then two... I kept my focus straight ahead on the trunk of an old oak that had been there for a hundred years at least. How many times had I played around that tree with chance? Or we'd climbed out of our windows and into its branches? Jack? I'm fine, I rasped, then cleared my throat. I'm all right, really. Finally, I turned the SUV off and climbed out. I snagged my bag from the back seat while Nyala did the same with hers. Then together, we moved toward the front door. I held out my hands, sensing the warding I'd placed hadn't been tampered with. Everything's intact. We should be good. Briar said they'd hang close until we were in and settled, just in case, Nyala reminded me. And they'll be here tomorrow or the day after to lay some extra protections around the grounds. I nodded and let my bag drop to the leaf-littered porch. Moving closer to the door, I raised my hands again. Fire burned in my palms, then wrapped around my fingers. Doing my best not to picture the night my life fell apart, I flattened my hands to the door. The warding lit up bright red, the intricate designs covering not only the door but spreading until I knew the entire place would be glowing in the night. I didn't want to destroy the warding, merely parted enough for Nyala and me to enter. The spells I'd woven the last time I was here shifted before my eyes, rewriting themselves and settling once again into the structure of the home. There was the familiar clicking of four heavy-duty bolts. Then the doors swung inward. I reached into the left, felt for the switches, and turned them all on. Welcome home, I whispered to myself. A black iron chandelier hung from the vaulted ceiling of the living room that we stepped right into. The second-floor balcony overlooked the living room. Lamps on both end tables gave the room a cozy feeling I'd always marveled at for a space as large as this one. Two standing lamps flanked the stone hearth that was currently void of a roaring fire. The dark plaid couch, matching chairs, and ottoman stirred memories I'd done my best to shove down deep. The rug that should have been beneath them was long gone. I'd burned it to ashes after my parents' bodies had been carried out of the house. There wouldn't have been a way to salvage it with so much blood soaked into the fibers. Nyala's cool hand slipped into mine and squeezed. She didn't say anything. Not that she had to. Merely having her with me helped me not go berserk and set the whole place on fire. I had been tempted to do it the night I'd walked away. That temptation was still there. Maybe I would once this was all over. I chuckled darkly to myself. If I asked Briar to burn the place to the ground if I died so my brother could never come home, I had no doubt she'd do it for me. Want a tour? I asked. If you're up for it. Or I can wander, if you don't mind. No, a tour is fine. We can drop our bags off at the stairs on the way. Hand in hand, we moved deeper into the house. To the left of the living room was a wide wooden staircase done in dark mahogany. The railing was black iron to match the chandelier and the rest of the fixtures. Beyond the stairs was one of the many halls that led to various workshops and to both of my parents' studies. We poked our heads into each room, flipping on the lights as we went. Each time a bulb turned on, there was no rush of fear or panic as I'd expected. My heart lifted instead, and several times I had to swipe at my eyes. 
we turned down another short stretch of hall with only two rooms off it. Stepping into my mother's study on the left, Nyala grinned. I could stay in this room for hours. My mom usually did. I rested my shoulder against the doorway and glanced around. The walls to the left were lined with shelves stacked high with books and trinkets brought back from her travels, everything from wooden statues to dried bundles of rare flowers. The desk was as messy as it had been the last time she'd been in here. There were more haphazardly stacked books and files all over the floor. The faint scent of coconut lingered, too, from the soaps she'd used. The plants she kept on the windowsill were miraculously still alive, but needed some care. Where do those doors lead? Nyala pointed to the double set of pocket doors on the right side of the room. My dad's study. Sometimes they wanted to work together, other times they needed their space. It was rare those doors were ever closed. I went to the doors and slid them open. The lamp beside Dad's desk, far more orderly than Mom's, was the only light that turned on when I tried it. The rest were burned out. A flood of memories I hadn't expected crashed into me. I smiled, recalling the laughter that came out of these two rooms. All those moments I'd peeked into the doors to find Mom and Dad dancing their way from one study to the next, or how they'd use their magic to bug each other during the day sending paper airplanes or fiery songbirds. They were only ever serious when they needed to be. They'd loved each other so much. I hadn't ever thought anything could break them. Warmth spread from my chest, and a subtle wind drifted over my cheek. Nyala was at my side instantly. She slipped her arms around me and hugged me. My head fell to her shoulder, and I let the emotions come. My shoulders shook, and the grief I'd shoved deep down beneath layers of anger and the need for revenge finally came out. After a while, I straightened, and Nyala wiped the last of the tears from my cheeks. She kissed one, then the other, and gave me a smile that said she was here for me. Right, I said. Want to see the rest of the place? I showed her around the kitchen and the pantry that would need to be restocked. I showed her the door to the basement that held more workrooms. I also pointed out the several greenhouses outside in the garden. There was another hall leading off the living room, but I was saving that room for last. We picked up the bags we'd left at the bottom of the steps earlier and moved up to the second floor. There were numerous rooms up here, too. Most were used for storage. My parents' bedroom was at the end of the hall to the right. For now, we avoided going there, and I aimed for where my old room was. I can show you the guest room if you want, I told Nyala. Really? she said with a laugh. Unless you don't want me to see your old room. She waggled her eyebrows while I rolled my eyes. I opened the door, wrapped an arm around her waist, and kissed her while I backed us into the room. I didn't bother with the light at first, too occupied with the woman before me. Her frost-covered hand slid up under my shirt. I shivered from the soothing cold and sent my fiery magic to play with hers. There was more of the house to show her, but I couldn't resist taking a few moments for ourselves. I pushed her cardigan over her shoulders, and she removed it the rest of the way with a laugh. She tugged at my sweatshirt next, and I pulled it over my head, taking my t-shirt with it. She ran her fingers over my bare chest, leaving frost patterns on my skin. I held her chin between my thumb and forefinger, tilting her head back so I could stare into her ice-filled eyes. Lightly, I brushed my lips over hers, then did it again. She stood on her toes and took control of the kiss, pushing me back toward the wall. I buried my hand in her hair, spun us around, and lifted her off her feet. Her legs wound around my waist, and I decided the rest of the tour could wait until morning. Whatever you made smells fantastic. Nyala's sleeping voice came from the doorway of the kitchen. It was about half past eight the following morning. I'd woken up with the dawn, unable to believe that not only was I back home, but Nyala was beside me. I'd left her to sleep chest tightening the second she curled up with my pillow and burrowed back under the blankets. I'd spent the few hours alone showering and quietly going through the rest of the house. Nothing was out of place, and the warding was holding all the way round. Nyala came to the stove I stood at. She slipped her arms around my waist and leaned into my side. I draped my arm over her shoulders and kissed the top of her head. There's coffee, I told her, and the bacon's almost ready. Mmm, bacon. Great way to start the day. You could have woken me up. You looked like you needed your sleep, I said with a wink, while she poured herself a cup of coffee. 
I rested my hip against the counter, taking in the sight of her wearing my long-sleeved shirt and fuzzy socks. Her hair was a mess, but God, she was gorgeous. The realization that if we did manage to break the curse, and this could be our future, hit me hard. I wanted that life. I wanted a future with Nyala, living in this house together, and picking up where my parents left off. There was no denying how I felt for her. And I knew how she felt about me. She showed me with her every look, every touch, every smile. I nearly blurted out the words right then, but swallowed them back. It caused me to cough, and Nyala hurried back toward me. I'm all right, I assured her, just choking on my spit. You're still feeling okay? If I weren't, you'd know. Can't hide anything from you. Damn straight, you can't. The potions were working for now, and that was all I could ask. After the dagger had been destroyed, we'd stayed in Silent Heights another full day, waiting for another batch to be delivered. There were enough upstairs to get me through a month, provided they kept working like they were supposed to. I took Nyala's coffee from her, then picked her up and sat her on the counter. I moved my hands up her thighs, quickly growing lost in how light her eyes became. I couldn't help but kiss her then, loving how she deepened it. We only broke apart after we remembered the bacon and I hurried to salvage it. There's one room I want to show you before we do anything else today, I told her while we munched on crunchy bacon and toast. Oh yeah? You seem really excited about this room. Trust me, you will be too. Great. Let me shower and put some clothes on first. You could walk around like that all day, I beamed at her. I wouldn't complain. She bent down, gave me a searing kiss, and whispered, Tomorrow. She slipped away before I could snag her by the waist, cackling while she purposely swayed her hips. I groaned, but let her be and cleaned up the kitchen. By the time she rejoined me, wearing skinny jeans and a navy blue sweater, I was standing in the hall we hadn't ventured down yet. I handed her a mug of coffee, knowing that room was always drafty this time of year. I led the way down the hall, lined with various paintings that my family had done over the years. Several of my great-grandparents on both sides had been quite the artists. At the end of the hall was a set of oversized double doors. You ready? I asked Nyala. She was bouncing on the balls of her feet. What is it? I opened the door on the right, then pushed the one on the left in, too. They swung inward, and the Scott family library waited for us to enter. Holy shit! Nyala whispered, easing into the room one slow step at a time. Three stories, I told her. This collection spans centuries. How? I thought everything was cleaned out. The vault was emptied, I said, nodding across the room to where one of the bookshelves was still hanging wide open. Beyond it was a short hall that led to a set of stairs going down. That was where my parents had stored the most valuable and dangerous items. Gabriel and Erickson couldn't have cared less about dusty old books and scrolls. Niall had touched my arm in comfort, but I was holding it together today. The anger remained. I was sure it always would. But for right now, being here with Nyala was its own form of therapy I hadn't realized I'd needed. Go on, I told her with a grin. Nyala set her mug down on the nearest table, then took off. The library was beyond impressive. Every bit of space was filled with shelves of books. There was an entire wall with only scrolls and another boasting a massive collection of catalogued loose pages that had been found in various tombs over the centuries. Five glass cases occupied the center of the room, each housed an ancient text that was far too delicate to be handled, one for each of the elements. Two spiral staircases flanked the main doors. The few windows that were on the southern side of the room were framed by sheer ivory curtains. The ceiling was a dome shape and painted to resemble the night sky surrounded by the phases of the moon. Four work tables were set up, one in each corner. On the wall to my right was a massive stone hearth with a comfy seating area in front of it. A bucket of kindling and a rack of firewood sat on the stones, waiting to be used. I went to the hearth to get a fire going. There was certainly a chill to the air in here. Once the flames had taken to the kindling, I spun around searching for Nyala. She was already up on the third-level balcony, a stack of books in her right arm. I'd be lucky if I got her out of this room sometime today. What I was most interested in were the journals kept by my parents. They were tucked away in a corner. I turned on the standing lamp close by. The ten shelves were loaded down with a random assortment of journal bindings. 
all were dated and initialed as to who had written each one. Might as well start at the beginning, I murmured to myself and reached for the one on the very top shelf to the left. My hope was to find references to specific books in the library within the journals. It would help me narrow down the search. There was a reference catalog for the entire collection. I was going to check that too. But the journals called to me, probably because I missed my parents. These might give me a chance to be close to them again. Hey, there's a whole section up here on curses. Nyala called down to me. I might be up here a while. Bring them down by the fire so you don't freeze at least. I doubted the cold would bother her, but she'd be so much more comfortable sitting on the oversized couch than she would on the floor as she was currently doing. I looked at the journal in my hand, reminded myself to hold on to hope, and went to search the catalog for what could possibly save me from dying a horrible death. Chapter 4 Nyala Frost crept over the pages of the book. I eased back on my magic before I ruined what was probably a one-of-a-kind text, slammed it shut, and set it far gentler than I really wanted to on the end table. The table was already covered in other various books that had turned up useless this last week and a half. In all of the books in this damn library, I expected to find something mentioning the curse of creeping death. But there was nothing. Jack hadn't had any luck yet either with his parents' journals. He'd skipped ahead to the ones they wrote during the year the coin came into their possession. Without an exact date, though, he was left to sift through the entire year, and his parents kept extensive records. He'd searched through their studies a bit, too, but finding anything useful in there would take time. For the first two days, Jack had some moments where the sadness would hit him hard, followed by his grief and his anger. He'd been able to move past it and get on with whatever he was doing. These last couple of days, however, that had changed. It had started with a nightmare. I'd woken up first. Jack was muttering in his sleep. I'd heard my name, and not long after, he woke up drenched in a cold sweat, yelling, and so pale. It had taken a while, but I'd gotten him to go back to sleep at least until dawn. Over coffee, I tried to get him to talk about the nightmare, but he'd refused and disappeared into his mother's study for the rest of the morning. A few hours later, that was where I'd found him, hunched over and violently coughing. Blood had covered his palm, and the look he'd given me chipped away at the positivity I'd been doing everything in my power to hold on to. Since then, Jack had started to close himself off from me. This round of potions was beginning to fail, just as the first batch had. He'd only had one coughing fit, but it was enough. Nothing could hold back this curse forever. Now he hardly slept, too afraid to close his eyes and face whatever horrors the night brought. I hadn't seen him eat much either. I got up off the floor where I'd been studying by the hearth and headed for another section of shelves. If I couldn't find something in this library to give Jack hope again, I wasn't sure how long it'd be until he'd shut me out completely. Aimlessly, I wandered around the first floor of the library, then climbed the steps to the second level. I hadn't scoured these shelves yet and started with the books right in front of me, skimming the titles while I went. The news I'd gotten from Briar yesterday probably wasn't helping the situation either. After a bit of poking around Academy, Hunter and Trisha were able to track down someone who was only pretending to be a student. The Talons hadn't broken his cover, but with Briar's help, they'd been able to discern who he worked for and why he'd been there. General Erickson did have eyes on Jack, or she had while he'd been at Academy. When Jack had heard the news, he stepped outside and unleashed a firestorm that would have destroyed any of the plants out there if they'd still been alive. The good side, Briar had told me while I'd watched Jack lose his shit, was Zack's brothers were doing an excellent job of spreading rumors of Jack's current whereabouts. Those, of course, were nowhere near where he was right now. As far as General Erickson was concerned, Jack had left Academy after a horrible breakup with me and was heading to the West Coast. Headmaster Hook was playing along too, informing anyone who asked about me that I'd taken some time off and was visiting my family while I dealt with some personal issues. It wasn't ideal, but if it gave Jack some breathing room, I didn't care. The Pierce brothers had also stopped by last night to up the warding again around the Scott home. They weren't taking any chances of us being caught off guard, 
in case Erickson or Gabriel decided to send anyone here just in case. Jack hadn't said a word the entire time they were here. I meandered down a few more shelves, not even sure what I should look for anymore. I hadn't exhausted all the curse books yet, but there were so damn many. Many of the recounting in those texts weren't very helpful about how to break them either. And as Jack had reminded me numerous times, finding out how to break one curse meant nothing if it wasn't about this particular curse. What we needed was the origin of where the creeping death came from. If we couldn't find that, anything else we tried would be a long shot at best. Hoping I'd get lucky, I selected three books that had several chapters on enchanted coins and medallions, and returned to the first floor and the fire still burning happily away in the hearth. It would have been warmer if Jack was here, but he hadn't stepped foot in the library all day. The couch he'd been occupying when he was in here was empty and cold without him. The stack of his parents' journals lay scattered over the floor and cushions. The warm light of the day that had fallen over the cushions had faded. The sun had set over an hour ago while I'd been wandering the stacks. I doubted Jack had bothered to fix himself something to eat. I filled with a book in my hand, wondering if I should go track him down and force him to get something in his stomach, no matter how small. That'd just lead to an argument, and he was already mentally fragile. Nagging him wouldn't do any good. You have to let him deal, I told myself. You can't hover all the time. I sat back on the floor cushions and thumbed through the first book. Only half paying attention to the pages, I nearly missed the picture of six gold coins sitting on a blue bed of velvet. There was no name for them around the photograph, but the section of the chapter was titled Coins of Illusion and went into a very detailed explanation of what they could do. Curious if these might be the same coins Gabriel had been photographed purchasing at the black market recently, I placed my fingers between the pages to hold my place and left the library to find Jack. He wasn't in the kitchen or the living room. Both of his parents' studies were empty, as were the various workrooms at that end of the house. I called out to him a few times. The lack of response caused my heart to race. What if he'd had a fit somewhere and had passed out? Jack? I raced upstairs, darting into his room that we'd been sharing. He wasn't there, and the bathroom was empty too. Jack? Answer me, please. In here. His voice came from the other side of the house. I rushed down the hall, heading toward the room Jack had avoided the entire time we were back in his family's home. The door to his parents' bedroom was wide open, and he stood a few feet inside the threshold. Jack? I, I don't know why I came in here, he whispered. I just opened the door. I'm not sure how long I've been standing here. The lamps that flanked the bed atop two dark cherry wood nightstands were on. Their soft yellow glow lit up part of the room. The rest remained mostly in shadow. A fine layer of dust covered everything, and the air smelled stale. The bed was unmade, and there were clothes scattered about the floor and over the armchair in the corner. Several books were stacked on the nightstand to the right, and on the left, more were open to various pages, resting face down. The room had been frozen in time. Do you want to pick it up? I asked softly. I don't mind helping. He shook his head. His jaw clenched, and fire sparked at his fingertips. The intent to set the room on fire flashed through his eyes. I braced to stop him, not about to let him do something he'd regret come morning. But he backed away toward the door, then stepped out into the hallway. His breaths came in heaving gulps, and he sagged against the banister overlooking the room below. When he sank into a crouch, covering his face with his right hand, I knelt beside him, holding onto his shoulder to remind him he wasn't alone. When his breathing evened out, I helped him upright and hugged him. Have you eaten anything today? I asked, already knowing the answer. Not hungry. How about I make something anyway? You need to eat at some point today. I'll be all right. I bit my cheek. Pushing him would get me nowhere. Why don't you try and get some rest then? Just for a few hours? There was no argument to that suggestion. Taking his hand, I guided him down the hall to his bedroom. He climbed onto the bed and laid down. I moved to lay down beside him, and he immediately pulled me into his arms. He kissed the top of my head. I snuggled closer, easing a frosty hand under his shirt to rest on his chest. In minutes, he was snoring quietly. I stayed with him a while longer, willing him to not have any nightmares this time round. Leaving a layer of frost over his skin that would stay with him until he woke, 
I eased out of his arms and slipped off the bed. He stayed sound asleep. On tiptoes I made for the doorway. Once in the hall I remembered the book I'd left the library with. I dropped it somewhere in the living room before darting up here. The coins I'd found could wait until tomorrow. Food couldn't. Hoping he'd be hungry enough to eat once he woke up, I figured I'd go make something for a late dinner. There was plenty of food in the pantry, freezer, and fridge now. Briar and Zack had brought us almost enough groceries for a month a few days ago. I wasn't the best cook in the world, but I was sure I could scrounge up some frozen pizzas if nothing else. My stomach grumbling reminded me I hadn't eaten anything all day either. Halfway down the hall leading to the kitchen, a noise at the front door stopped me. Was that a knock? Slowly I turned and waited. It wasn't a knock, but something was on the other side of the door. Or someone. The warding wasn't reacting. Was it Briar or Zack? Jack had adjusted the spells to recognize them and the rest of the Pierce brothers. One of them would have texted me, though, if they were stopping by. The noise came again, and this time I knew what it was. Someone was unlocking the deadbolts on the front door with their magic. Readying my powers in my hands, I pressed my back to the wall and waited. The last bolt slid to the right, and the doors opened wide. The figure stepped inside, lifted his head, and my stomach dropped. Holy shit! Jack. I awakened with Niall's name on my lips. Was it a dream that jolted me out of sleep? No, for once I couldn't remember anything except peaceful darkness. The bed beside me was empty and the room was dark. The bathroom light was off too. Unsure what had dragged me from sleep, I prepared to lay back down. Then the pricking at the back of my neck came. It quickly turned into a sharp sting and I ran for the doorway. The trap I'd placed on the front door had triggered. Someone was in the house. I was already pulling fire to my hands by the time I hit the top of the stairs. Nyala's voice reached me first, followed by a second one I hadn't heard in a long, long time. There, stuck at the front door by the trap I'd laid, was Chance. Gleaming orange flames held onto his feet, keeping him in place, and standing just yards away from him was Nyala. There was ice on her hands, but she didn't appear to be in distress. I wasn't about to let her get there, either. A furious shout left my mouth. Chance's head shot up at the same time a burst of fire crashed into his chest. It lifted him off his feet and slammed him into the wall beside the front door. His hands remained at his sides. I charged him down. Another ball of fire erupted from my left hand to hit his chest. His head bashed into the wall and he sagged. A rope of fire shot out of my right hand. It wound around Chance and pinned him to the wall letting me see his damn face. Jack, Nyala called out, but I could hardly hear her over the rushing sound in my ears. How dare you come back here after what you did, I snapped. How dare you step one fucking foot onto this property? Chance, my little brother, who was always smiling and had a shine to his eyes, looked like he was inches from being claimed by death. His skin was pale and his face gaunt. There were dark circles around his eyes, eyes that were watery and dull. There was a true fear right there on his face, and how he recoiled from my fire, as if expecting it to burn him alive at any second. He had on a brown leather coat, but it appeared to be a few sizes too big with how thin he'd become. There was nothing to him. It was like he'd been trying to become part of the wind so he could blow away with it. His mouth opened and closed a few times and I noticed his lips were chapped and split, but no sound came out. I curled my right hand into a fist, tightening the rope of fire around his body. He cringed, every inch of him tensing, and yet he made no move to fight back. There wasn't even a puff of air being disturbed by him using his summoning. Jack, stop, Nyala said beside me. Why? I curled my hand even tighter. Chance gasped, struggling to breathe. Good. Now he could feel some of the pain I'd dealt with since Gabriel cursed me. Nyala's cold hand grabbed hold of my arm. Don't do something you'll regret. He's the reason for everything, I reminded her, and the flames brightened. He's the reason I'm cursed. He's the reason our parents are dead. Did you know he was going to kill them that night? I asked Chance. Did you? That I'd have to watch them bleed out? The fire constricted more, and still Chance refused to push back. 
I could break his ribs so easily now. I could let the fire burn him. Part of me was confused why it wasn't yet. I supposed, deep down, my power still remembered growing up with him. It knew it wasn't supposed to hurt him. Times changed. It could burn him alive right now, and I wouldn't care. Jack, Nyala said, firmer this time. Look at him. I am. No, you're not. Her grip on my arm fell away. I glanced at her for a second, then returned my gaze to Chance. He was pinned to the wall a few inches off the floor. He looked like shit, I'd already decided that. I blinked, and her eyes locked. The dullness in his wasn't dullness at all. It was grief and pain, and so much regret. It reached out and was like a slap to the face. The rope of fire uncoiled slightly, though it kept him trapped against the wall. Chance's shoulders sagged, and his face crumbled. Jack. He rasped, his voice so weak compared to what I was used to hearing. I'm sorry. I'm so fucking sorry for all of it. You're sorry, I repeated, my voice quivering with rage. I can't say it enough, and I know I can't do anything to convince you that I never meant for this to happen, he went on in a rush. But please, I need to speak with you. I risked everything to come here. Why would I listen to anything you have to say? Chance nodded. I understand that I do, but I need you to listen. That's all. Just listen. All I could do was stare at him. Look, after I get this out, if you want to turn me in, fucking kill me, I don't care. I didn't come here to fight. I came here to help before it's too late. Too late? I shouted. It's already too late. Mom and Dad are dead, and you cursed your only brother. You broke our family into pieces. And for what, huh? For Gabriel? For Erickson? Tell me, how's that working out for you? Chance fell to his knees in front of me, then ended up on all fours. What are you doing? Get up! I demanded. Chance sat back on his heels, his head hanging. Do what you want with me, but you need to know what they're planning. Please, Jack. He sounded so small right then. So weak. So broken? Nyala touched my arm again and nodded her head to the right toward the sitting area. Ensuring my fire remained around Chance to stop him from moving, I followed her away from Chance. You need to hear him out. I shook my head. Are you insane? Look, I know you didn't want to think it was possible, but remember what I asked you? If there was a chance he wasn't doing all of this on purpose? That maybe he was as trapped as you were? I scoffed, but... Nyala took hold of my chin and turned me back toward Chance. That's not what someone who's living their best life looks like, she whispered. That's someone who's been picked apart piece by piece. Trust me, it's not the first time I've seen someone look like that. All he's asking is you hear him out. After, we'll hand him over to the Talons. He's your brother, Jack. He's still your brother, no matter how much he's hurt you. For a moment, Chance appeared to change before my eyes until he was the little kid following me around while we pretended to sword fight, racing around the house like maniacs. His happy laughter flooded my mind and held back the urge to make him hurt. I stomped toward Chance. I'll listen, but I'm not making any promises on what happens after. He slumped in relief. That's all I ask. Unsteadily, he got to his feet. I shifted the fire, moving it to his wrists like manacles. He flinched away from the flames, but didn't argue. I nodded toward the kitchen, and he led the way. Nyala gave me an encouraging nod and brought up the rear of our little party. I told Chance to take a seat at the kitchen table. Nyala said she was going to put the kettle on and make some tea to warm everyone up. I wanted to ask her why she was being so nice to my brother, but she raised her brows at me, motioned to Chance, and went about making the tea. Unable to sit, I stood opposite Chance. Never did I think he'd be that much of an idiot to come back to our family's home. Did you know I was here? I asked. No, I came here to look for a way to stop them. Then I saw the lights on and felt the warding had been changed. Friends of ours, I told him, to keep the enemy out. Chance clasped his hands together on the table in front of him. 
I'm happy to see you. I wasn't sure if you'd ever... You said you wanted to talk, I reminded him. So talk. His hands clenched. I waited to feel a ripple of air movement from his magic. Its absence ate at me as much as his lack of fighting back. I should have listened to you, Chance whispered. When you told me to leave, that what we were doing every day was changing me. I should have fucking listened and come home. But I didn't want to disappoint you or our parents. I wanted to prove that I was strong enough to handle anything. A single tear slipped from his eye. I was wrong, Jack. I'm weak. I'm not a Scot. I crossed my arms, putting up a physical wall between us as well as an emotional one. Nothing he said would change my mind. Nothing. Those few weeks when you couldn't find me? Gabriel and Erickson had me. Chance went on, his watery voice trembling. His shoulders shook too. Then the words tumbled out of his mouth while he told us what had been done to him, and with each word I became more torn between believing him and wanting to call him a liar. He only paused in his ramblings after Nyala brought over a mug of hot chamomile tea. He thanked her, giving her a curious look, then sipped on the steaming beverage for a few seconds. Those seconds gave me a chance to sift through what he'd told us. When he disappeared, it hadn't been because Gabriel was convincing him to betray his family. According to Chance, he'd been taken and tortured for information. Jack, Chance said, but I couldn't bring myself to look at him. I tried to hold out. I did, but I was never as strong as you. He sniffed hard, and I had to struggle even harder to keep my gaze aimed at the damn floor. They broke me, and I... I... I couldn't stop myself then. Chance had tears streaming down his cheeks while he continued to try and get the words out. His desperation only seemed to break him apart more. He buried his face in his hands while his shoulders heaved. An act. This had to be an act. Why would I believe anything he said? How could I trust his story of being taken captive and tortured? Of being forced to betray us all? I don't... I started to say, then had to stop and clear my throat. How do you expect me to trust that what you're saying is true, huh? How? Chance shook his head. I don't know. I fucked up, I know that. But God's Jack, I never meant for any of this to happen. But it did because of you. Even as I said it, I heard the falseness in those words. The blame didn't only lie with chance. I'd failed too. I can't trust you, I repeated. Maybe you don't have to, Niall said from her spot at the table. What do you mean? Briar, she told me. I can text her and the others. Have them come here. She can get inside his head, see if he's telling you the truth. Besides, the Pierce brothers should speak with him. They'll want to question him. Chance gave her a confused look until she explained what Briar was capable of. Do it, he said without hesitation. Nyala excused herself to go make the call, leaving me with Chance. But I couldn't be in there with him, not alone. I didn't trust myself. Ensuring the fire was going to hold him at the kitchen table, I stormed out of the kitchen and into the backyard. He had to be lying. He had to. Believing what he said wasn't an option. How could it be? If he'd been taken and tortured for weeks? No, it wasn't possible. I dragged my hands through my hair, then tilted my head back to glare up at the night sky. There were no stars out tonight. The cloud cover was too thick. Snowflakes had started to fall, leaving tiny cold pinpricks against my cheeks and forehead. Briar would get here and call Chance out for being a liar. Then I could hand him over to the Talons. They could be his problem. And if he's telling the truth, you let your brother be taken by those monsters. You're just as bad as they are. My stomach roiled, and I rushed to the side of the yard, heaving into the dead bushes. Thankfully, I hadn't eaten anything all day, but the retching left my stomach aching. Shaking, I wiped my mouth and straightened right as the back door slid open. Jack? Briar's on her way. They'll be here in a few hours. We should put Chance in a room somewhere until they get here, I told her, returning to the back door. She nodded and told me she'd take care of it. She took hold of my hand, stood on her toes, and kissed my cheek. 
Everything's going to be fine. You'll see. She gave me a small smile, then ducked back inside to see Chance to her room. Not willing to leave her alone with him, though, I sucked it up and followed. The front door opening interrupted my mad pacing around the living room. Dawn was only an hour away. Nyala was dozing on the couch after refusing to leave me alone. And Chance, my traitorous little brother, was upstairs passed out. I checked on him every half hour. He hadn't tried to break out or use a summoning. He hadn't done anything except sleep as if he hadn't been able to do that in a long, long time. Briar stepped through the front door first, followed by Zack, Luke, and Nick. I pointed to Nyala on the couch, and Briar went to wake her up. How are you holding up? Zack asked me. I glared at the stairs. How do you think? He just shows up here with this damn story about being tortured and expects me to believe him? We'll get the truth out of him, Zack assured me. Bri's good like that. I managed a nod. Then Zack told me they should get set up somewhere they could ward the room in case anything went wrong. I directed him and his brothers down the hall toward my parents' studies, telling them they could use any of the workrooms at that end of the house. Nyala was talking quietly with Briar until I went over to join them. I should get Chance and bring him down. I glanced toward the second floor, but couldn't get myself to move. I can get him, Nyala volunteered. No, he's my brother. I'll deal with him. I'll meet you two in the room with the others. Not giving her time to argue, I moved toward the stairs and headed up. We'd put Chance in his old bedroom with a magical lock on the door to ensure he'd stay put. With a wave of my hand, I removed it and stepped inside. The fiery manacles I'd placed around his wrists remained burning bright in the dimly lit room. Posters of his favorite bands from when he was a teenager still covered the walls. There were piles of clothes here and there on the floor and on the chest of drawers. His room, just like our parents, had been frozen in time. The single lamp on the desk in the corner cast shadows over the bed. For a moment, Chance was a kid again, snoring after a long day of playing outside with me. I swiped a hand down my face and reality caught back up with me. Get up, I said loudly. Chance jerked upright, blinking the sleep from his eyes. Jack, they're here. Let's get this over with. When he took too long to get up, my patience shattered. Move, now. I snapped my fingers and the fiery manacles lurched forward, dragging Chance up and off the bed. He stumbled, barely able to stay on his feet. With a hand on his arm, I steadied him. He mumbled a thanks and I immediately let go. I led the way out into the hall, not about to feel an ounce of sympathy for him right then. How could I when I still had no idea what the truth was? At the bottom of the stairs, I glanced at him over my shoulder. He appeared even worse off than when he'd first arrived through the front door. Stealing my nerves, I continued downstairs to the first floor and headed to the workroom the others had chosen. It had little in it as far as furniture went. Dad had used this room as a safe space for testing potentially dangerous artifacts. There wasn't much in it aside from four chairs and a table that had been shoved to the side for now. A small wooden cabinet occupied the far left corner, wedged into the space. In it were various crystals and candles that Dad had used over the years. The stone floor was covered in old wax drippings and burned-in sigils that had lost their potency years ago. Briar was already sitting in the middle of the room with an empty chair facing her. The Pierce brothers had set up magical protections around the perimeter. Once Chance and I were inside, Luke closed the door, completing the circle. Nothing would get in or out easily. Have a seat, Briar said to Chance. I can't guarantee this will be painless. Chance shook his head while he took his seat. I don't care. I've learned to deal with pain. I frowned at his words, and a knot began to form in my stomach. Chance looked at the others in the room, then stared right at me. I just want the truth to be told. That's it. Briar gave me a slightly concerned look. I shrugged, silently asking her what she expected me to do. She pursed her lips then returned her attention to Chance. She raised her hands, ready to place them on either side of his head. Wait, I blurted, stepping forward. I want to see what you see. Can you do that? You want to go with me inside his head? She asked. Is it possible? Briar shot a look toward Zack. Oh, 
it's possible, but it's not going to be a pleasant experience. You're both going to end up with some killer headaches, possibly a nosebleed. She hesitated, then cringed and added, I'm not entirely sure you're up for it. Chance gave me a confused look. Ignoring him, I dragged over another chair. I sat down beside my brother, then patiently waited for Briar to get on with it. Fires burned dark red in her eyes, but she didn't try to talk me out of it. This is going to sting a bit, she whispered. Everyone, hold on. She shook out her hands again, then reached out one for Chance's head and one for mine. My skin prickled with her magic. Her fingertips pressed against my forehead, and I cursed at the sharp, stabbing pain in my skull, quickly followed by the sensation of being yanked out of my chair and thrown off a cliff. I struck something solid, or it felt like I did, at least. You all right so far? Briar's voice came from beside me. I turned, and she took form. She was see-through, and after I held up my hand, I realized I was, too. In front of us was a kaleidoscope of images and sounds, as if we were watching a mishmash of movies all at once. What is that? Chance's memories. His mind is a damn mess, she muttered. This isn't going to be fun. We're going to be seeing everything from his perspective, feeling it. From what I'm sensing already, it's going to be a nightmare. You sure about this? I don't have a choice. I need the truth. If this is how I get it, then so be it. She took hold of my hand and we dove into the memory stream. It was pure chaos. We bounded from one fractured memory to another. Briar's face scrunched in concentration. She seemed to be searching for something. The second she found it, she let out a triumphant yell and reached forward as if to grab hold of whatever it was. We fell out of the rushing flow of memories to find ourselves in a dank room that smelled of mold. There was a single bulb hanging from the ceiling. We appeared to be in a cellar of some kind. I was confused at the view until I remembered we were essentially inside Chance's head looking out. He groaned in pain where he was hunched over in the corner of the room, curled up so tightly as if he was trying to disappear. Behind us a door creaked open. Chance curled up even smaller, whining like a wounded animal. Here, Chancey, Chancey. Gabriel sing-songed while he strode into the room. Come and get your treat. My stomach dropped, not wanting to believe what I was seeing. My brother lifted his head. From his perspective, it was hard to tell what state he was in, but I could see enough. The hair that hung in front of his eyes was matted. His face ached and throbbed, as if it had been beaten on recently. His clothes were filthy and torn in places, burned in others. There were streaks of blood on his hands and arms and more on his clothing. How are you feeling today, hmm? Gabriel asked, walking to the center of the room. Fuck you, Chance spat, his voice hoarse as if he'd been screaming for hours. Gabriel sneered. Ah, oh, Chance, this would go so much better for you if you would simply tell me what I want to know. Chance turned his back on Gabriel. A gust of viciously cold wind whipped up and dragged Chance to the center of the room. It slammed him onto the hard floor face first and pinned him there. Briar and I cringed, experiencing the impact he had. Gabriel sighed, strolling around Chance while he clicked his tongue in disappointment. You'll break eventually, Gabriel told him. You're not strong like your brother, you weak Chance. You've always been the weakest of the Scott family. Chance started to laugh. What's so amusing? Gabriel demanded. Jack's gonna find out what you're doing. He's gonna burn you alive. Chance told him through laughter that bordered on madness. Being inside his mind, I sensed how close he was to losing it. And I'm gonna watch with a smile on my face. Is that so? Chance grinned wider until the door opened again, and Chance began to shake, fighting to get up off the floor. Gabriel's wind kept him down, not giving him anywhere to go. Elena Erickson stomped forward in her shiny black boots. Her hands were clasped behind her back while she glared down at Chance. You haven't broken him yet. And here I thought you were the best, Gabriel. He's close. 
I'm sure he is, but you won't be the one to push him over the edge. Erickson tilted her head, and the smile she gave Chance was filled with pure malice. Now then, Chance, I think it's time you and I had a proper chat. The memory shattered around us, and Briar cursed. We were flung into another one, but only caught glimpses of the room. Those glimpses were bad enough. Chance screamed, and the stench of burning flesh hit my nose. Pain seared my torso. For a second I thought I was dying. My brother's pleas for mercy were cut off. Then we were dumped into another memory, and another. They ran together in an endless stream, with each one experiencing the same pain he had. My fury grew right alongside my guilt. Just when I was sure I couldn't handle it anymore, the onslaught of images came to a sharp halt. If I'd been in my physical form, I was sure I would have been vomiting. A broken mirror leaned against the wall in front of Chance. I hardly recognized my brother in his reflection. His face was a mottled mass of blood and bruises. His shirt was gone and his torso was covered in oozing burns. He lay on his side, one eye swollen shut, while the other stared blankly ahead. Near the door, Gabriel and Erickson stood discussing plans for how to access the Scott mansion. They'd gotten what they'd needed. Don't, Chance rasped. Don't hurt them. Please, don't. Gabriel went to Chance. He grabbed him by his hair and lifted him off the concrete floor. We'll take good care of your family. And when we come back, you'll have a choice to make. Continue to be my plaything, or join me and reap the rewards. He cackled, dropping Chance to the floor and strolled out of the room with Erickson. Briar touched my arm, and the next second I slammed back into my body. Nyala was saying my name, her eyes wide with worry. I tasted blood on my lips and assumed my nose was bleeding. It could wait. I mumbled to her I was fine and turned my full attention to Chance. He held his face in his hands, and his shoulders shook while he broke down. Zack was asking Briar what had happened, but I never heard a reply. Chance, I whispered, then quickly removed the fire manacles from his wrists, realizing now why he'd reacted to them as he had. Chance. He shook his head, doubling over even more on the chair. I'm sorry, he whispered through his sobs. I wasn't strong enough. I'm so fucking sorry, Jack. It's my fault. Everything is my fault. He kept trying to talk, but the words didn't make sense anymore. They didn't have to. A well of emotion rose inside me, then burst out while I reached out to hold my brother. I pulled him into my arms and we knelt on the floor together. None of this is your fault, I told him, tears wetting my cheeks now too. None of it, you hear me? I should have found you before they could hurt you like that. I failed you. Chance was shaking his head. I gripped his shoulders and sat him back. I never should have believed the worst. You never would have betrayed us. Never. But I did. I told them everything. You were tortured, Chance, I uttered, and he trembled beneath my hands. I don't blame you for anything. I'm just sorry I didn't find you in time. I pulled him back into a bear hug, not believing I had my little brother back. We'd lost our parents, but we had each other. Even if the curse killed me, Chance would live on. He'd keep going for our family. We'll pay them back for this, I promised Chance, Gabriel and Erickson. We'll make them hurt. Chance nodded and finally got his arms up to hug me back. He was a little kid again, running to me after he'd had a nightmare. I'd failed to protect him once. I wasn't about to do that again. Even if it was the last thing I did on this earth, I'd see Gabriel and Erickson suffer for what they did to Chance. Chapter 5. Nyala Jack and Chance sat at the kitchen table. This time they were right next to each other, and Jack kept glancing at his younger brother like he couldn't believe this was real. They'd both come out of the workroom boasting bloody noses and headaches. All of that paled in comparison to being told what Chance had endured at the hands of Gabriel and Erickson. You were right about him being the victim. 
I should have listened to you. Jack had whispered to me while I'd cleaned the blood from his face, then handed him a fresh t-shirt. We'd gone up to his bedroom for a few minutes, giving him and Chance a few moments to recover. Briar also had a headache and needed time to settle. You had no reason to think it was true, I'd reminded him. He's my brother. That should have been enough. Jack hadn't been able to meet my eyes after that. It'd take a while for him to get over the guilt that was probably trying to eat him alive now. Now, while we sat at the table drinking hot tea or coffee or whiskey, a heavy silence had fallen over the house. It wasn't only that we'd heard what Chance had gone through from Briar and Zack. It was that we'd seen Chance's scarred torso, a reminder that he'd carry of all he'd survived. I'd only asked to see it after I'd noticed how uncomfortable he'd seemed to be after coming out of his old bedroom in fresh clothes. He'd taken some time to shower and freshen up before rejoining us down here. Once Chance had raised his shirt, I'd asked him if I could try to soothe the scars with my summoning. I wasn't a healer by any means, but water magic was adept at soothing old wounds better than any other element. It was why the cold worked so well with Jack. While the ice had formed a protective layer over him from neck to waistline, I'd had to bite back a curse. The scars were beyond terrible. Jack had rested a hand on Chance's shoulder, a promise in his eyes that Erickson wouldn't get away with doing this. How did you escape? Zack asked, breaking the silence that had descended on the kitchen. Chance spun his mug around, looking a little more comfortable with a layer of frost over his skin. Dumb luck, if I'm honest, he muttered. After, uh, after Gabriel and Erickson came back that night, they told me what they did. My heart went out to him. Jack rested a hand on his brother's arm, telling him to take his time. Chance nodded and had to clear his throat a few times before he could go on. They kept me locked up in that damn room for a few more months. By that point, I was too broken to do much of anything except whatever Gabriel ordered me to do. It was that or he was going to put me back in that room. Or a cage. Chance shuddered. Crimson flames danced in Jack's eyes with his anger. But he kept his fire in check for his brother's sake. I did what I was told to do after that. Then, I don't know, a few months ago, it was like somebody gave me a jolt. Chance whispered. It was the weirdest thing. I thought, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. What happened? Jack asked. I dreamed about Mom and Dad. They were just there with me. Didn't say anything. Chance laughed and shrugged. I don't know what it was, but I woke up and I decided I wasn't going to keep being the weak piece of shit Gabriel made me believe I'd become. So I paid attention. And once I put the pieces together of what he was up to, I knew I had to leave. He didn't trust me, though. I was watched constantly. He gulped, and for a second, I thought he was going to be sick. He kept staring at his hands like he was afraid of them. Chance? Jack asked. You know, I thought it'd feel different, he murmured. That, I don't know, it'd feel justified taking out those two assholes. But all I felt was cold numbness. Still do. I can still hear their dying breaths while I stole the air from their lungs. He closed his hands into tight fists on the table. It's why I haven't been able to use my summoning. How can I, after what I did? Don't do that to yourself, Jack ordered fiercely. Chance, look at me. His brother took a deep breath, then met Jack's eye. You did what you had to do, all right? Gabriel, his men, they would have killed you at some point. And I almost guarantee the two you took out were some of the ones who were here the night Mom and Dad were killed. They don't deserve your sympathy. They were here. Chance glanced out the kitchen doorway and down the hall. They told me in vivid detail what happened that night. A few times. He let out a shaky breath, then sat up straighter. After I got rid of the bodies the best I could, I ran. It took a week to get here. I had to be careful not to let others know where I was. When I opened the front door, I honestly thought I was walking into a trap set by Gabriel. Instead, it was you. And I nearly killed you on sight. Jack clenched his jaw. I'm sorry, Chance. I would have done the same, honestly. This plan that Gabriel and Erickson are putting together, what is it? Luke asked. 
I'm not 100% sure, but from the few pieces they've put together so far, I can guess. They're trying to reassemble the key to Gorgren. I sat back in my chair and turned a wide-eyed gaze at Jack. They can't, can they? They'd have to have immense power, he said slowly, then cursed. Which they're probably close to having. The artifacts Erickson's been after all this time, she wasn't taking the power for herself. What's this key thing? Briar asked. Essentially, it can open a portal to a fucked up world, Jack told her. You want monsters galore? That's the key he used to get them here to our world, and whoever controls this key controls whatever comes through. It won't just be monsters running amok, it'll be an army at her beck and call. The key is thousands of years old. People thought it was a myth for ages until the first three pieces were found. How many pieces are we talking about here? Nick asked. From what our parents discovered? Seven, Chance said. Does Erickson already have some of these pieces in her possession? Chance shrugged at Luke. I would say she has to have at least one or two if she's already stockpiling artifacts to use their magic. Nick whistled long and loud. We have to tell Adam. She's ahead of us. Way ahead, Luke murmured. Out of all this shit we thought she was planning, opening a portal to get an army of monsters never crossed my mind. Why can't the bad guys go back to being simple bad guys? Nick lamented. You know, trying to assassinate one of the masters or something. Hijack a council meeting. Why do we have to keep getting stuck with the psychopaths, huh? Luke patted his brother sympathetically on the shoulder. Right, we need to head out, he announced. You three stay here. He pointed to Chance, Jack, and me. We'll add a few more layers of protection to the house on our way out, just in case. Before we go, we need every bit of intel you have involving Erickson and Gabriel, Nick added, and whatever you might have on this key to Gorgren shit. There's probably something in the library, Jack stood up telling them he'd go and get the information for them. He barely stepped out of the kitchen. Then the coughing started. It turned violent in seconds, followed by a crash. Jack! I ran out of the kitchen. He was on all fours with a table tipped over beside him on the floor. Blood spattered the hardwood planks beneath his hands. His entire body shook, and he gasped in between coughing, struggling to get air into his lungs. Covering my hand in frost, I slipped it under his shirt, then flattened it to his sternum. He covered it with one of his, his skin covered in a cold sweat. The blood kept flowing over his lips until there was a small puddle on the floor. When the coughing finally subsided, I pulled him back into my lap and let him rest there. I don't understand, Chance said, standing nearby and staring in horror from Jack to the blood on the floor. It's the curse, I told Chance. I know, but you should have lifted it. I told you where to find the dagger. Why didn't you use it? That was you? Chance nodded at my question. Jack, why? You're not supposed to be cursed anymore. I saved you. I fed Gregory the information, all of it. I don't understand. The dagger was tampered with, I said, to which Chance's face fell. Jack was able to get it, but it turned to dust the second he tried to use it. He's still cursed, and we... Uh, we're not sure if there's a way to remove it now. No, Chance whispered, falling to his knees beside Jack. It's going to be fine, Jack told him, managing a smile. You'll see, everything's going to be fine. He coughed again, and more blood dotted his lips. Why don't I get you upstairs so you can rest? I can track down everything on the key. Jack didn't argue with me, and with Chance's help we got him to his feet and upstairs. Once Jack was cleaned up and lying in bed, I layered more frost over his chest to ease the pain. He caught my hand and brought it to his lips. I don't think I tell you enough, he murmured. What's that? How much you mean to me. He gently squeezed my hand, pulling me closer and kissing me. How much I love you. I scrunched my eyes shut, willing the tears not to fall, not yet. I returned the kiss, then tucked him beneath the blankets better. I'll be back soon. Get some sleep. By the time I reached the door, Jack was already out. I didn't know, Chance whispered. 
I glanced up to where he stood beside Jack's bedroom door. How could you have? I just... I thought I'd saved him. He looked so lost while he stared into the depths of his brother's room. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's no time for that, all right? I said, proud of how steady my voice was. We've got an evil bitch of a general to stop from opening a damn doorway to a monster world. You know your way around the library, right? Maybe you can go and get started on finding that research. I'll be there in a minute. Once I was alone, I slipped down the hall to the other bathroom and locked myself in. With one hand covering my mouth to muffle my cries, I sank to the floor in a heap. Tears flowed down my cheeks, and frost burst out of me to cover every inch of the bathroom. When chance had shown up, I thought our luck had changed. Maybe that we were going to get ahead of this horror show and find a way to stop Erickson and Gabriel and save Jack before it was too late. But the despair that had been growing in my gut hadn't gone anywhere. Jack was running out of time, and now we had to worry about Erickson opening a portal with the key to Gorgren. How are we supposed to get through this? How was I supposed to save Jack now? Nyala? Briar called through the door. I... I just need a sec, I called out. I'm sure you do. Open the door, please. Doubting she'd go away until I did, I reached for the lock and flipped it. Briar stepped inside, took one look around, then closed the door and hugged me tightly. She didn't try to console me with words, which was for the best. What she did do was promise me with a single look that no matter what happened next, she'd help me make those bastards pay for hurting Jack, for taking him from me. After a while, the sorrow turned to anger, and the tears stopped flowing. Briar helped me back to my feet, gave me a firm nod, and together, we headed downstairs. Chapter 6. Jack Checking my reflection in the mirror again, I ensured there were no specks of blood on my lips or chin. Nyala had been down in the library and far away from me when the episode had brought me to my knees. It had started with a damned hallucination of Gabriel in the bedroom. Then it had turned into his killing Nyala right in front of me. The coughing had started right after. So far I'd been able to keep how bad the curse was becoming from Nyala. It had been nearly a week since Chance had shown up, and we'd learned about Gabriel and Erickson's plan. Desperate for any information on the curse or the key of Gorgren, she had her head buried in books pretty much all the time. I didn't have the heart to tell her it was hopeless at this point, at least when it came to removing the curse. There was nothing left to try. If there had been, we would have found it by now. The pain ripping through my chest was the hardest to hide. It was the other reason I hadn't complained about her spending so much time away from my side. The familiar ache lingered in my chest. Breathing brought with it the sensation of shards of glass in my lungs. I curled my hands around the edge of the counter, compartmentalizing the pain as much as possible. Once I could straighten without grimacing, I left the bathroom and opened the bedroom door. Chance, I blurted at my brother, who was leaning against the opposite wall, arms crossed and face drawn. What are you doing up here? His face was already looking fuller, and his skin was no longer pale and sickly. His clothes hung on him, but there were no more dark circles under his eyes. He was recovering, slowly, but he was getting there. Mentally, I knew he would take far longer to heal. I wasn't the only one waking up from nightmares under this roof now. He had at least been able to withstand being around my fire for short amounts of time. You can't hide it from her forever, he warned. Hide what? He rolled his eyes. Seriously, she's not blind, and neither am I. You're getting worse. It's not just one fit a day now. What are you up to, three? Four? Keep your damn voice down. She's in the library with the doors closed. A subtle breeze whipped down the hallway, driven by his aggravation and worry. Dad used to do the exact same thing when Mom was stressing him out. I was merely happy to see him using his summoning again, even if it was just an emotional reaction. How bad is it? Bad enough. I started to walk away, but Chance caught my arm. When I turned, his face was filled with regret and shame. I squeezed his hand hard, making him look at me. This isn't your fault. How is it not? Because I failed you first. Jack, come on, we've been over this. It doesn't change anything. I should have seen what was happening to you, I whispered. 
so many months of regret making my words harsh. I'm your big brother, Chance. I swore I would protect you and not let anything happen to you. And you followed me into that hellhole with that promise, and I broke it. If I'd paid more attention, if I hadn't gotten so wrapped up in the shit Gabriel was making us do, he would have found us out sooner, Chance argued. You're the reason we were able to stay with him without him knowing who we were for so long. And what did we get for our troubles? Nothing. It sounds as if all of this led us to Nyala, which led us to the Talons. Erickson's being investigated now, and we know what shit she's been up to all these years. We got way further than Mom and Dad were ever able to. He paused and the wind blew again, much gentler this time. I've heard about them, you know, while I was underground. The Talons? Gabriel's scared of them. I laughed at him once for it, suffered for it afterwards, but he's not as fearless as he lets everyone believe. Great, so maybe after I'm dead, Gabriel will finally get what's coming to him. Jack, Chance said. Footsteps sounded from down below. I held up my hand to cut him off, then peered over the railing. Nyala was in the living room and headed our way. Later, I whispered to my brother and moved toward the stairs to meet her. Hey, what are you two doing? She asked. I kissed her cheek and slipped my hand into hers. Not much. Catching up. Good. I'm going to take a shower and get some of this dust off me. Then I figured we could do something fun this evening. Like a movie night? You've got some of those in this massive house somewhere, right? I'll go dig them out, Chance volunteered. Mom's got a whole collection. Great. Nyala smiled at me and continued up the stairs. Her endless optimism would always astound me. Chance's inhale told me he was getting ready to say something, but I shot him a look. He sighed, then said he was going to go track down some movies. He left me standing on the stairs, torn between telling Nyala the truth and doing what I could to protect her from it for as long as possible. Chance handed me a fleece blanket to cover Nyala. She'd fallen asleep lying on top of me on the couch in the living room. We'd had another movie night, but she'd passed out halfway through. Chance had turned the volume down, and I didn't have the heart to disturb her to get her upstairs to bed. Thanks, I whispered to my brother and covered Nyala. She smiled in her sleep and snuggled closer. I brushed my fingers through her hair, admiring her face in the soft glow of the fire in the hearth. You know, when I came back here to find a way to stop Gabriel, I'd wondered if I might find you were pissed off and ready to murder me on sight. But what you have with Nyala? Let's just say, I'm glad you found your happiness. Too bad I found it too late. I mused. Maybe it's not. What are you talking about? The dagger's gone, I reminded Chance, and no amount of reading that Nyala does is going to miraculously find a counter curse. The anger that usually accompanied my admission was no longer there. Sometime over the last couple of days, I'd come to accept my fate. I was going to die. It was tragic and horrible, but at least I'd be able to spend these last few months with Nyala. I'd found love experienced it for myself. I hated the fact that I was leaving her, but she was strong. She'd grieve, then she'd find a way to move on. You're so full of shit, my subconscious whispered. Are you really willing to give up? What about what you found out regarding Gabriel and Erickson? What if you can't stop them before you up and die on everyone? I grunted to myself. Understanding how horrible the plan those two villains were concocting was had put me on edge. I was going to do everything I could to stop them before the curse took its toll on me, but there was no guarantee. I'd be leaving them to fight a horrendous battle on their own. There's another way. Chance's words broke through my spiraling thoughts. When what he'd said finally clicked, I nearly sat up until I remembered Nyala was sleeping on me at the last second. What way? Why didn't you say anything sooner? I asked, my temper rising. What game was he playing? Because it's not exactly safe and last I checked, it hasn't been done successfully. He stared down at the floor and whispered, We might be able to transfer the curse from you to someone else. The idea had crossed my mind once before, but only because of the nightmares I'd had of Nyala dying from it, instead of me. Not a consideration I was willing to entertain, full stop. I shook my head, fighting the urge to yell at him. That would only wake her up. There was no way in hell she could hear this conversation and no way I'd let my brother take on this burden. Jack, you can transfer it to me, Chance went on. I'll take it for you. I glanced at my brother, sitting on the edge of his seat with desperation in his pleading look. Are you fucking joking? No, it's not happening. You've been through enough. 
So you found the love of your life. And you expect me to simply sit back while you lose her? While you die? I'm not going to do that. Not when there's a way to save you. Yeah, we save me. Then I have to turn around and watch you die? I said no. I don't technically need your permission to do it, Chance pointed out, a challenge in his words. If I have to trap you in a damn fiery cage, I'll do it, I warned fiercely. The answer is no. You just had to inherit Mom's stubbornness, Chance muttered. Transfer the curse to me and save yourself. Please, Jack, let me do this for you. It's the least I deserve after everything that happened with Mom and Dad. I can't. I can't save them, but I can save you. Let me do that, please. Tears glistened in his eyes. He slipped off the chair and kneeled on the floor, so close to where our parents had died. His hands gripped his thighs, but whatever else he wanted to say came out as a strangled gasp. Gently, so as not to wake her, I shifted Nyala to the side and lay her on the couch. My heart feeling ready to explode, I went to my brother and kneeled in front of him. Chance, look at me, I ordered, my own voice ragged with emotion. Chance. He shook his head and scrunched his eyes shut tighter. A tear slipped down his cheek and I didn't wait for him to look at me. I dragged my brother into my arms and hugged him like I used to do when we were kids and he was scared. He cried against my shoulder, whispering he was sorry over and over. He wept for our parents and our broken family. When the tears slowed, I sat him back and gripped him by his shoulders. Mom and Dad would be beyond proud of you, I told him, and he shook his head. They would, Chance. Look at everything you risked coming back here. You kept fighting even after they broke you. You came home. But still, I broke. You're human, I reminded him gently. But you didn't give up. You came home, I repeated. Chance, you're home, and you're helping to stop them. No one could ask any more from you. I'm not the one who deserves to keep living their legacy. Don't you dare say that. You are as much a Scot as I am, do you hear me? I yanked him into another bear hug, willing him to believe what I said. You deserve a fresh start. Don't ask me to give you a death sentence. Finally, Chance nodded, and I inwardly sighed in relief. I needed Chance to remain strong so that when I did die, there would be someone left behind to carry on what our parents started. There'd be someone to stop Erickson from getting that damn key and winning. We sat on the floor in front of the hearth for another hour or so, feeding logs to the flames and remembering the times we'd spent together in this place as kids. How much trouble we'd get in together, the pranks we'd played on each other. So many memories filled this house. I hoped they'd be enough to keep Chance going after I was gone. I glanced over my shoulder at the couch where Nyala was still sleeping soundly. Chance and Nyala going, I supposed. You should get her upstairs to bed, or she's going to wake up with a crick in her neck, Chance said, nudging me with his elbow. I'll see you in the morning. Your turn to cook. Ha! Remember the last time I made eggs? I still don't understand how they ended up on the ceiling. You scared me, and a gust of wind splattered them up there. Stains are still on the ceiling from the yolks. I smirked. Oh, I know. I clapped him on the shoulder, then stood up, stretching my arms over my head. My eyes slipped to Nyala, and my heart lurched. Chance? Huh? Do me a favor. Don't mention anything about the curse transferred to Nyala. When he took too long to answer, I nailed him with a heated stare. Chance, swear to me you won't tell her how to do it. He held up his hands in surrender. Fine, I swear. Thank you. Make sure you get some sleep tonight, too. I told him goodnight, then gingerly picked Nyala up into my arms. She frowned but remained passed out. I wasn't the only one who hadn't been getting much sleep lately. Once upstairs, I eased the door shut with my foot, carried Nyala to bed and lay her down. I tugged my t-shirt over my head, slipped out of my jeans and crawled into bed beside her. She shifted on the bed, moving until her back was pressed to my chest. I draped my arm over her waist, drawing her in as close as I could get her. A lazy ribbon of fire seeped out of my hand and coiled around us in the dark of night. Her frost answered covering our bodies in delicate patterns of ice that burned with my embers. How many more nights would we get to spend like this? I'd tried desperately not to think about it, but the thought plagued me every time the sun went down. The transfer spell could work, but that would mean putting someone else's life in danger. Unless it was Gabriel or Erickson I was shifting the curse to. 
It was my shit to deal with. I kissed Nyala's shoulder, whispering to her that no matter what happened, everything would be okay. She'd make it. She was strong. She'd make it without me. She would. Chapter 7. Nyala. The retching coming from the bathroom jolted me awake. I threw the blankets aside, blinking away the blurriness from my eyes. Jack was hunched over the bathroom sink, failing to catch his breath while blood dripped from his chin. The sink was already filled with it. I eased my hand around to his chest while I used my other to rub circles on his back. I knew he'd been getting worse despite him doing everything he could to hide it from me. His belief that I was in the dark seemed to make him feel better. I wasn't going to let him pretend any longer. There was no point now, not when the fits were this intense. For the last few days, I'd had to act as if I hadn't noticed him in agony, or how many times he'd disappear upstairs for an hour, only to come back down pale and shaky. Though Jack was usually warm, his skin burned hot with a fever. Sweat coated his forehead, and he shivered despite how warm the bathroom was right then. He retched again. His legs trembled, but I had him lean on me, helping him stay upright. When he spat a final mouthful of blood out and was finally able to take large, gulping breaths, he shook even worse. Come on, let's get you back to bed, I said softly. I need to grab you something for the fever and wash the blood from your face. Nyala, he started, but I scowled at him, and he sighed instead of arguing with me. I'd barely got him situated in bed and resting, then he was bolting upright again. Holding his hand to his mouth, he stumbled toward the bathroom. Jack made it to the toilet this time, and stayed there for what felt like an hour, but was only minutes. There was so much damn blood. He sat back against the wall, pale and wobbly. He kept trying to speak, but the words were little more than mumblings under his breath. The rest of the night passed in a blur of me getting Jack to bed to rest for maybe half an hour or an hour, then another fit would take hold, and he'd end up on the bathroom floor after spitting up more blood. Chance came in after the fourth time, bringing with him some tea he'd brewed that might help. The fever became worse, and Jack started hallucinating around dawn. At first it was the usual, seeing Gabriel in the house, or Erickson coming for him. But then the visions became worse. At one point he merely stared at his hands, murmuring about them being covered in blood. My blood. Jack, I said, kneeling in front of him and cupping his face. Jack, look at me. I'm right here. Nyala, he breathed, while tears slipped down his cheeks. No, it's not possible. Nyala, I'm sorry. How did this happen? How did I lose you? Jack, look at me. Taking hold of his chin, I forced his head up. Finally, his eyes latched onto mine, and he weakly yanked me into his arms. I fought to keep my own tears at bay and held him. Chan stood in the doorway to the bathroom, his face set and his eyes overflowing with fear and regret. Together we helped Jack from the floor and back to bed. Chan said something about getting fresh towels for the bathroom and let us be. What's today? Jack whispered. Gently I pushed the hair away from his forehead and pressed my lips there. What does it matter? You need to get some rest. Close your eyes. I'm scared to. He fumbled for my hand and kissed my palm. What if I close them and they don't open again? He sat up straighter, grunting from the pain it caused him. I scolded him, but he waved me off. Once he had his back pressed to the headboard, he turned to me. What's today, Niall? The seventh. Why does it matter? His head fell back against the headboard. Good. I haven't ruined it for you yet. What are you talking about? Valentine's Day? Our first one. I have something special planned for you, for us. His eyes darkened with grief. But now... I pressed my fingers to his lips. We're not going down that path yet. Do you hear me? And do you think I care about some made-up holiday? Taking my other hand, he held both on his lap. His thumbs rubbed over my knuckles, and he refused to look me in the eyes. He started to speak and stopped himself several times before he finally cleared his throat. I'm going to ask you to do something for me, and I want you to do it. I stiffened. No. You don't even know what I'm going to ask. The hell I don't. It's the same thing you've been asking me since I found out the truth. I'm not leaving you here to die. It's not happening, so stop asking. My voice trembled and tears burned in my eyes. I don't care how bad this gets. I don't. I'm staying right here until... until whatever happens, happens. 
Until I die, Nyala, he whispered, moving his hand to hold my cheek. I can feel the end coming closer. The pain is worsening, and I'm so damned weak most of the time. I don't want you to be here to see it. I tried to turn away, but he had enough strength in him to prevent me from doing that. Please, it's going to get worse than it already is. Which is why I'm staying. And if I say it's my dying wish for you to go? I glared at him. Anger bubbled up, and frost exploded in a storm around the bedroom. I wrenched myself out of his hands and stomped for the door. I'm going to check on Chance. Nyala. I slammed the bedroom door behind me, cutting him off. I passed Chance in the hallway and told him I needed a few minutes. He promised he'd stay with Jack, and I hurried down the stairs toward the other wing of the house. I needed to get as far away from Jack as I could. I needed space to think and fall apart without him seeing how little I was holding it together. At the end of a dead-end corridor, I finally stopped and let the emotions flow. Tears poured from my eyes, and my shoulders shook with each sobbing breath. I slid down the wall to the floor, falling to my side. Frost spread over the hardwood and curled up the painted walls to the ceiling overhead. The entire hallway became a corridor of ice. More frost hung suspended in the air around me. I was losing Jack. The hope I'd fought to keep a grip on since we came to his home was fading. It was merely a shadow now, an echo of the future I'd thought we could have. I curled into an even smaller ball there on the floor. I was useless. Nothing I could do would save Jack. Nothing. There was no word from Headmaster Hook or the Pierce brothers about finding another way to lift the curse. Every day I waited for that one text that would give me a reason to believe the nightmare would disappear. Between all of us searching, we'd come up empty. This was it. This was the end. I couldn't even make Jack comfortable anymore. The curse was making that impossible. Tears froze on my cheeks, thawed, then froze again in an endless stream. Nyala? Chance called down the hall. Shit, are you all right? He ran toward me, falling to his knees on the ice-covered floor. I sat up, resting my back against the wall. How am I supposed to be all right? He hung his head and sank back, so he was sitting all the way down. I don't know. Is he sleeping? Yeah, I put a wind sigil over him. I'll know if he gets up again. His eyes skipped around the hallway, and a grin tugged at his lips. This is pretty damn impressive. Thanks. Too bad my magic can't help Jack. I can't even ease his pain anymore. And now the idiot keeps trying to get me to leave. What's wrong with him? Why does he do that? Why does he think I'll leave him alone to die? I ranted, and more ice exploded from my hands, shattering the fragile designs that had covered every surface in the hall. Now they were sharp and jagged, just like my anger. He doesn't want you to suffer like he is, Chance whispered. He loves you too much. And I love him too much to leave. He knows, Chance told me. He feels helpless. I thought coming here and having so many people out there searching for an answer that one would miraculously fall out of the sky, that there would be something we could do, anything. Chance shifted beside me. When I glanced over, he avoided my eye. What? I bit off. Huh? I didn't say anything. No, but you've got a weird look on your face. No, I don't. It's the same look Jack gets when he's trying not to tell me something. Chance continued to look everywhere else but at me. He shrugged. I have no idea what you're talking about. A nervous stuttering of air swirled around us. I gripped his arm. Chance, is there a way to save Jack? His eyes widened a hint and his muscles bunched beneath my arm. There is, isn't there? What the hell is it? Why didn't you tell Jack or me? I demanded, my anger rising until he spoke again. Jack already knows, he blurted, then clapped his hand over his mouth. He knows what? Chance, damn it, just tell me, please. I pleaded, and finally he met my stare. Tell me how to save Jack. I swore to him I wouldn't. So there is a way. Not proven, Chance said in a rush. Niall, please don't make me break my promise to him. I've already fucked up so much. Please. If there's a way to save him, you're going to tell me, and I'm going to do it. Even if it means risking your life instead? I frowned at his words until the truth of what he wasn't saying hit me. A transference of the curse. That's what you're talking about, right? A way to shift the curse from one person to another? Chance's head fell forward. Damn it, Nyala. 
You know how to do it? Rumors of how to do it. Just rumors, he emphasized. No one's ever done it successfully because every curse is different. One of this magnitude, it might be impossible. And if anyone has succeeded, no one's bothered to write it down. It's all through stories. It's better than nothing. Chance pulled away from me, clambered to his feet, and paced halfway down the hall. When he whipped back around to look at me, I sensed he was about to tell me it wasn't happening. I offered already, he told me. I tried to let him let me take the curse and he refused. There's no way in hell he'll let you do it. I already swore I wouldn't, I admitted, remembering that I'd promised Jack I wouldn't put myself in harm's way to save him. What are you talking about? It doesn't matter, which was true. Nothing mattered right then except finding a way to save Jack. He needed more time. And if this was the way to get that for him, then so be it. He'd just have to forgive me later for breaking my promise of not risking my life for his. I'll deal with the fallout, but you have to tell me how it's done, rumors or not. If you don't, I'll come up with some spell on my own that will most definitely fail and make everything worse. I stood up and went to Chance. He hesitated, but I saw him make up his mind before he opened his mouth. From what I've heard, it's damn dangerous, especially with one as potent and as wrapped around Jack's soul as this one is. There's a chance it won't work, and you'll end up cursed just as he is, without taking it from him. I'll take that chance. He threw his head back and ran his hands down his face. Fuck, Jack is going to kill me. Or he'll want to kill us both, which is fine, as long as he's alive. Chance stayed silent for ten horribly long seconds. Then his arms fell to his sides, and he gave me a determined stare. We need to get the potion together, and I'll have to write out a spell for it. We'll have to be careful with the wording, extremely careful. There's no spell to go along with the rumors, sadly, but the potion, that I have a better idea of what will work. I can use what's in it and base the wording on that. It's the best I can manage. Give me a list of what we need. I'll get the potion going. I started to walk off, but Chance's hand on my arm stopped me. What? It should be me. No, this is on me. What? How? He asked, confused. It just is. Come on, we've got work to do, and we have to get it finished before Jack wakes up again. I led the way down the hall, willing the spell to work. Forty-five minutes later, and Chance handed me a spell that he'd reworked at least ten times. I read over the words, nodding my approval. He certainly had a knack for spell work in a pinch. I'd combined the necessary ingredients. Thankful Jenny and Clark Scott had kept such full stores. The potion itself had been ground and then boiled until it turned a vibrant shade of violet. The swirl of black at its center was what Chance had described to me. Remember, you have to trace the symbol on his chest, then yours with the potion. Chance explained before I entered Jack's bedroom. You need to use your blood before you start the spell to also trace the symbol on him. Then lay your hand on the center of his chest, in the middle of the symbol, and say the words three times. Once you have hold of the curse, you need to pull it into yourself. How will I know when I've got it? It's damned evil. I think you'll know, he said, his eyes darkening. I wish there was more I could tell you. He'd run through every story and rumor he'd heard over the years, in case there was something else that might help us. As far as I could tell, we were as prepared as we were going to be. Are you sure about this? he asked. Wait out here, I replied, giving him what I hoped was an encouraging smile. Don't come in until I call you. He nodded and seemed to be fighting the urge to grab the potion and spell from my hands to do it himself. Before he could, I hurried into the room and shut the door behind me. The day had been overcast, putting most of the room in shadow. Jack lay on the bed, his skin red from the fever, and his face scrunched in a grimace of pain. The blankets were bunched at his waist as if he'd been fighting against them in his sleep. I set the potion and the spell on the nightstand, then leaned over and kissed his forehead. Don't worry, Jack. I've got you. Everything's going to be all right. You'll see. He mumbled, but I didn't understand what he was trying to say. His eyes remained closed. That was all that mattered. He was already shirtless after getting blood on the last ones. Shaking out my hands and clearing my mind the best I could, I focused on the spell and my intentions driving it. My magic hummed inside me, and I prepared to cast the transference. After removing the cork from the potion, I traced the sigil Chance had given me on Jack's chest. The symbol represented not only the curse afflicting Jack, but stealing it from him and giving it to another. Once it was drawn on him, 
I unbuttoned a few more buttons on my flannel shirt and did the same to myself, adjusting the sigil so that I was the one receiving the curse. The potion tingled unpleasantly on my skin like ants had gotten on me. I gritted my teeth and ignored it. Creating a small icicle out of the air, I used it to stab the tip of my finger. I hissed at the pain and how my fingertip throbbed. If this worked, I'd be dealing with far worse. I could handle a finger prick for now. With my blood, I retraced the sigil on Jack's chest. The potion glowed with my blood. Jack shifted on the bed. His eyes fluttered, and I held my breath. Five seconds. Ten. Jack didn't wake. I pressed my left hand to the sigil on his chest, picked up the spell in my right, and began to speak the words. With each one that fell from my lips, the potion pulsed brighter on Jack's body. A strange pressure built in my palm, too, and quickly spread to my fingers. On the second read-through of the spell, the sensation shifted until it was like I was touching something beyond Jack's chest. It was rough, almost like the bark of a tree. At the same time, it was smooth and sharp, stabbing into my palm. I winced, but kept going, pushing through the pain. On the final read-through of the spell, my hand flattened to Jack's chest. Something writhed under my palm, alive and fighting with everything it had to get away from my grip. The curse! It was there, and it was alive! It lashed against my palm, and my stomach clenched. I was nearly sick, but held on. Curling my fingers into a fist, I started to pull. The potion on my skin prickled like a thousand needles now. It began to glow, too, brighter on me than it was on Jack. The last of the spell filled the air, and instinct told me to draw my hand away from Jack. A dark, shifting mass came with it. What looked like a bundle of sharpened tree roots, gnarled and twisted together. The tips glistened like black steel. With each inch I pulled it out of Jack's chest, a new agony started in my own. The spell was working. Bit by bit I kept pulling, watching that mass come free of Jack's body. Nearly there. It was nearly there. Chapter 8 Jack Glimpses of the bedroom came to me in dreams. The horrifying sensation of something moving inside my chest dragged me the rest of the way from sleep. Nihala stood at the side of the bed, and it was her hand on my chest. But something was wrong. At first I thought it had to be another damn nightmare. A sharp, stabbing pain that went right through my chest told me I was wide awake. I glanced from my chest and the writhing mass beneath Nyala's hand to the glowing sigil on her chest. Her eyes were shut, and her magic swarmed over and through her. It filled the air, making it heavy and freezing cold, as if I'd stepped outside into a blizzard. The same sigil on her chest matched the one on mine, though hers was glowing. Mine was barely flickering. No, I rasped, realizing what she was doing. Nyala, no, don't! Whether she ignored me or couldn't hear, I wasn't sure, and didn't much give a shit. I wasn't going to lie there while she transferred this damn curse to herself. I raised my hand one inch at a time, pushing through the magic weighing me down. The mass of twisted darkness grew under Nyala's palm. She curled her fingers around it, pulling even harder to get it out of me. My back lifted off the bed. A searing rush of heat exploded at my center and spread through my limbs. Nyala's arm trembled. Then she was shouting. The mass was taking over her arm, winding its roots around her wrist and clutching her hand tight, and the marker in her chest was nearly blinding while mine dimmed even more. Driven by desperation, I pulled on my magic. The fire sputtered at my fingertips. It was like trying to light a wet match in the rain. It didn't help that I was already so damned weak. I strained every inch of me in agony. The sparks turned into tiny flames that danced around my fingertips. I held them together in my palm, letting my power build up. When I could hold it no longer, I thrust the twisting orb of fire between Nyala and me. A burst of bright red and orange light flooded the room. Nyala was thrown across the room and I smashed into the headboard from the force of the curse slamming back into me. The black mass shrieked while it sank back into my chest. Why? Nyala snapped, scrambling to get to her feet. Why did you stop me? I almost had you free of it. Why? You know why, I yelled back, in between gulping air in like a drowning man. What the fuck were you thinking? What were you? You promised me, I reminded her while I climbed off the bed. My anger was the only thing keeping me upright while I stormed across the room. 
You swore you wouldn't put your life at risk for me. We're out of options. You need time. I can give you that. Are you even listening to yourself right now? This is insane. I'm not going to watch you suffer. I won't do it. Nyala was fuming. Her eyes were the palest I'd ever seen them and filled with a frigid cold of winter. Ice spread from her feet out across the floor. I'm saving your life, you stubborn asshole. You think that's what I want? You're telling me you don't want to live? I stormed toward her, grabbed her by the arms and yanked her to me. The kiss was filled with heat and anger and everything else I couldn't possibly begin to put into words right then. I will not live a single day in this life without you, Nyala. I won't do it. But you expect me to? Tears shimmered in her eyes. They fell from her cheeks, creating trails of frost on her skin. It's not fair, she ranted through heaving breaths. None of this is. I did this to you, don't you get that? I did this, and I should be the one to pay the price. What are you talking about? She bit her lip and wouldn't look me in the eye. Nyala. Gently I held her chin, forcing her to face me. What price? You've done nothing but try and help me this entire time. It's my fault, she whispered. You'd have more time if I hadn't shown up in your life. How many times do I have to tell you this? I sent a gentle ribbon of fire to wind about her and me, bringing us even closer together. I regret nothing when it comes to us, when it comes to you. I'm glad I got this much time with you. You've made these last few months bearable. Shit, Nyala, you helped me find my brother. I think he sort of found us, she mumbled. I pressed my lips to hers, and she sighed, melting into me. I wound my arms about her, my anger at what she'd tried to do slipping away with each second. There was an urgent knock at the door, followed by Chance yelling through it. Are you two all right in there? I parted from Nyala long enough to open the door, tell Chance we were fine, and give him a look that promised this conversation between us was far from over. Rubbing the back of his neck, his cheeks bright red, he muttered something about giving us some space and hurried off to his own bedroom. Don't be too pissed at him, Nyala said after I'd shut and locked the door to our room. Why not? He broke his promise, too. Because I pushed him into it. If you're not mad at me, you can't stay mad at him. Turning around, I arched my brow and asked, Who says I'm not still mad at you? Jack. With my fire, I pulled her to me, cutting off whatever else she'd been about to say. Right then, I didn't want to hear it. I wanted to get through the rest of the night with her in my arms. Tomorrow, we could argue and yell at each other until we were blue in the face. I kissed her, slow and deep, while moving us across the room. She clung to me, and before long, our touches turned more urgent. Fire and ice danced around the room throughout the night and well into the morning. By the time the sun rose, Nyala was passed out and I was ready to join her in sleep. I kissed her forehead, tucked our clasped hands between our bodies, and shut my eyes. How long are you going to keep glaring at me? I shrugged at chance. Another few days seems appropriate. I turned another page in the journal I was reading, or attempting to read. I'd woken up some time around noon. Nyala had been passed out beside me still. Thankful that I hadn't woken up to find her attempting another transference spell, I'd kissed her cheek, tucked her in beneath the blankets better, and put on a fresh change of clothes. I was still feeling like shit, but so far today I'd had no fits. I was going to take advantage of feeling all right for as long as I could. With a fresh carafe of coffee, I'd headed into the library and prepared to pick up where Nyala had left off. As furious as I'd been this morning, knowing how close I'd been to watching Nyala take on the curse for me, it had made me admit I wasn't ready to give up. I'd keep looking for a way to break this curse until it killed me. Surrounded by stacks of books at one of the many tables on the first floor was where Chance had found me a few hours after. He'd hesitated in the doorway. I'd waved him in. Once he'd come inside, I'd used my fire to shut the doors and ripped him a new one for helping Nyala with the spell. Our argument had gone about as well as I'd expected. It was probably a preview of how my conversation with Nyala would go later today, once she finally got up. After, Chance had asked what I was doing. He'd offered to help without question when I said I was looking for any other way to remove the curse that would not place it on someone else I cared for. You know why we did it, right? Chance said, sounding disgruntled. The fluttering of curtains while his air summoning whipped around the library was a dead giveaway that he was upset with me still, too. That's not the point. Are you saying that if it was the other way around, you wouldn't have done it to save Nyala? I flipped another page, knowing damn well that's exactly what I would have done. 
I'm not sorry, he added softly, and neither is she. Slamming the journal shut, I tossed it on the table and got up to stretch my legs. Chance rolled his eyes at me, but went back to the massive book he'd been sifting through for the last half hour. Doing what I could not to rub the ache in my chest, I meandered through the library. I kept waiting for a book to jump out and snag my attention. Before Chance had come in, I'd even tried to use my fire songbirds to help me narrow down the search. I tried it after we'd first arrived and turned up nothing. I'd hoped by some miracle they'd still find something. All they'd done was flutter near the vault entrance because that was where the cursed coin had been kept. I sank onto the couch in the sitting area and set a fire in the hearth. The coffee table, end tables, floor, and armchair were overflowing with various books, scrolls, and a mess of loose pages. Those were mostly covered in Nyala's neat scribbles. I moved them around, noting what she'd found so far. It wasn't much to go on. Beneath a rather messy stack was a book with a single page sticking out of it, like it was marking a place. Curious about what Nyala had wanted to remember, I opened the book. At first glance, it appeared to be nothing important. Then I looked at the picture again. Shit, I whispered, holding the book closer to my face. What, did you find something? Chance asked. I'm not sure. He came and peered over my shoulder at the book. I know those coins. Gabriel picked them up a month or so ago. He dragged me along to authenticate them. Coins of illusion? Why would he want these? I skimmed the text on the pages surrounding the picture. They didn't seem to be that powerful. Why would Gabriel want them? Nyala must have recognized them. From where? I gave him a quick rundown of the photographs we'd been shown of Gabriel and him at the market. He didn't even seem upset that someone had been watching him. He didn't keep them, Chance was saying while the doors to the library opened. Who didn't keep what? Nyala asked, joining us. She wore yoga pants with one of my hoodies, and I had to fight the urge to pick her up, throw her over my shoulder, and march her right back upstairs. She caught my heated stare and winked at me. Did you steal the damn coffee craft out of the kitchen? Coins of illusion, I said instead. I held up the book, showing her the page she'd left marked. Shit, I knew I forgot to show you something the other day. There was a lot happening, then more happening. She hurried over and took the book from me. I thought they looked familiar, like the ones Gabriel bought. They are, Chance told her. But he didn't keep them, she asked, clarifying. No, he handed them off to one of Erickson's goons right after we left the market. Said it was important she get them right away. She had something, something planned. Chance's eyes went wide, then he clapped a hand over his face and cursed. That bitch! What? Chance looked at me, and a gust of wind whipped through the library, fluttering the curtains and sending loose pages flying. Letting it slip when I was around that she had the dagger. I think she knew I was feeding information to Gregory. She knew you were going to show up, and the coins. She used the coins. Slowly, I closed the book, filling in the pieces of what Chance was trying to say. You don't think... I trailed off, unsure I could let myself go as far as to believe it was possible. That dagger isn't an easy thing to destroy, and it's extremely powerful, Chance whispered in a rush. If she's trying to find the pieces of the key, why would she destroy something that contains so much magic? Besides, that blade is old. As powerful as Erickson is, it'd take a hefty dose of magic to destroy it. Wait, Nyala chimed in. Are you two saying that the dagger, the real dagger of vitality, the one that can lift the damn curse, might still be out there? Chance nodded at the same time I did. She used the coins to create an illusion, Chance explained, while his excitement caused another whirlwind to erupt around us. She has the dagger, which means we can still use it to save you. But how? Even if she's got it, that still means finding a way to get it from her? Nyala's eyes narrowed, then she glanced from me to the book and back again. Huh. What are you thinking? I asked. She used an illusion to set a trap for you. What if we do the same? I stood up, seeing the edges of a plan starting to form. It'll be dangerous. There's a chance it could go wrong. Then it goes wrong. But if this is our one opportunity to not only get the dagger but stop Erickson and Gabriel, we have to try. Nyala took my hand. We'll take a few days to sort out the plan. I'll call Bri and Zack. If we're going to set a trap, it's going to be a damn good one. We can do this. How would we even lure her in? Chance asked. The key of Gorgren, I said, and glanced toward the open doorway that led to the vault. We let it slip somehow that we found a secret vault in the house, 
and there's a piece of the key here. It's the only thing that will bring her to us. And getting her to reveal the dagger? Nyala had a good point. Even if we got Erickson here, why would she have the dagger on her? Why would she give up its location? Unless she thought she needed it to save herself. That damn smile, Chance muttered while I grinned like an idiot. That's the same damn smile you wore every time before we ended up doing something stupid as kids. Those plans always worked out, I reminded him. Ha, <laughs> yeah, sure they did. Nyala, make the call. Chance, you and I have some planning to do. Chapter 9. Nyala. Four days went by in a blur. Right after I'd called Briar and told her what we'd discovered, and our plan, she'd told Zack. Those two had shown up a few hours later with most of the Talons in tow, including all the Pierce brothers. Hunter and Trisha were here too, more than ready to help out with this plan of ours. It was a crazy plan, but it was the only one we had right then. It had to work. If not, I wasn't sure we'd find another way to save Jack before it was too late. On the morning of the fifth day, I was in the kitchen with Briar, Zack, and Hunter. Needing to talk about something other than how horribly wrong our plan could go, Hunter had been regaling us with details about his and Trisha's upcoming wedding. It was a nice distraction for a little while. She took the bait, Adam announced, entering the kitchen in a rush. Erickson, she's gathering her people and has reached out to Gabriel. He'd had his most trusted eyes and ears on those two since we'd started putting the pieces into place. Nick and Luke had been more than happy to follow their brother's orders and not let the general and her lackey out of their sight. How long until she shows up here? I asked. She'll be here by this evening, Adam said. I suggest everyone get ready. Take these few hours to rest up. We'll meet up again in a little while and go over the plan once again. He nodded, then hurried back out of the kitchen, probably to talk to the rest of the Talons scattered around the house and grounds. Hunter was the first to leave, saying he was going to find Trisha. Zack and Briar gave me encouraging looks, then they, too, left the room hand in hand. Wait, I said, and they paused. I know how much you two have already been through, and I'm putting you at risk again. So thanks for being here. It means a lot to me. Briar rolled her eyes, then came to me and hugged me so tightly I couldn't breathe. You're ridiculous, you know that? Why would we not help you? Because you're tired of winding up in shit situations like this. Your family, Nyala, she reminded me. And you would have done the same for me. You did, if I remember. Besides, we're not taking on some terrifying necromancer this time. Just some villainous general and her goons. Zack added with a wink. It's not like Bri hasn't been chomping at the bit to fight someone these last few months. I thought you were done with fighting, I asked. Briar shrugged. I've got Morris blood in me. What can I say? I just want to stretch my magical legs. What's wrong with that? Nothing at all. Zack assured her, then hugged me too. Once I was alone, I turned to stare out the back door. A rush of adrenaline shot through me. My hands shook, and frost rapidly covered my skin. It all came down to one night and one plan. The chances of it all going right were ridiculously small. But if it did, everything Jenny and Clark Scott had tried to do for so long would finally come to light. Erickson would be taken into custody, as would Gabriel. Her network would be dismantled, and Jack, Jack would be saved from the curse. He'd get to live, and finally we could talk about a future that didn't end up with him dying some horrible death. Steps came from behind me, followed by a brush of heat. Jack's arm slipped around me, and he rested his chin on my shoulder. His lips against my neck set a happy shiver down my spine. I studied our reflections in the glass, noting that he was smiling. We're gonna be fine he whispered. You'll see. I just want to fast forward through the fight and get there. He chuckled. You and me both. He frowned and his fire crept out to wind around me. I'm sorry for putting you through another fight. Seriously? I spun around in his arms. You know, I stopped being scared because of you. You reminded me that I'm not some weakling who can't protect herself and those around her. And if this one more fight means I get to spend a future with you, I'll take it. My words did nothing to erase the worry in his fiery gaze. I just wish it hadn't come to this. We have a house full of talons. 
I'm not saying I'm not nervous, but I feel pretty good right now. We've got this. I rested my hand on his chest. How are you feeling? After that doozy of a potion Adam brought with him, I'm great, Jack said with a laugh. I feel like I could go run a few miles at least. Hopefully the effects last until after the fighting's over. Coming down from this high is going to be awful. Adam had told Jack not to drink the potion until this morning. It was like the last ones, only about ten times more potent. The only reason they hadn't given Jack those before was how dangerous they were to his system. It was a massive boost, but once the potion wore off, Jack would be weaker than he was before the potion. You know, Jack murmured, hugging me close, we've got a couple of hours to kill. Something on your mind? A few things, he winked, then picked me up and laid me over his shoulder. Cackling, he carried me out of the kitchen and upstairs. I didn't complain. If things did go to hell tonight, well, I wanted to know I'd spent the last few hours I'd had with Jack simply being with him. He reached our room, kicked the door shut with his foot, and with his searing kiss, almost made me forget what danger awaited us this evening. The entire house shuddered and the power flickered. Erickson had arrived thirty minutes after sundown, and she hadn't been alone. Nick and Luke had arrived at the house with the warning that she was showing up with a small army at her back. The power flickered again, and I curled my hands into tight fists. I knew the plan. I knew that Erickson was meant to break the warning and get into the house. That didn't stop me from anticipating the fight ahead, or the urge to move out of my hiding place and do everything I could to keep her from reaching Jack. This was the part of the plan I hadn't liked. Jack had told me over and over it was the only way to draw Erickson all the way in. We needed her in the house. Once she was inside, the trap the Talons had spent the last four days working on would trigger. I was tucked away on the second floor in the bedroom. Briar and Zack were with me, standing right inside the door to listen. The illusion was fragile. If anything went wrong, it'd break, and Erickson would know she'd followed a lie to get here. That couldn't happen until she produced the dagger. Briar gave me a gentle nudge with her elbow. I glanced at her, and she whispered for me to keep breathing. I had no idea how we were going to pull this off without anyone getting hurt or dying, for that matter. I'd felt confident, up until the last time Adam ran through everyone's roles. It was simple, and yet so damned complicated at the same time. What if we messed up? What if Erickson never actually stepped foot into the house? What if we were wrong about everything, and the dagger had actually been destroyed? Stop it, Briar whispered in my ear. I can see you spiraling. I can't help it. We've got this, but the more you doubt it, the harder it's going to be to pull off. Briar squeezed my hands hard enough to hurt. Only think of the end game. We've got this. We can do this. I repeated the words, nodding to myself while I did it. The house trembled on its foundations, and after the next hit, the warding cracked and fell around the Scott home. Downstairs, the front door slammed open, bashing into the wall. I flinched from the impact. A man's voice called out to search the place. That had to be Gabriel. But what about Erickson? Where was she? Zack pressed his finger to his ear to where his calm was. His brow furrowed, then he nodded to Briar and me. Together we moved toward the bedroom wall and raised our hands. Zack held up his hand, silently telling us to hold. The moment he dropped his hand, Briar and I placed ours against the sigils that had been carved into the wall. The faintest ripple of energy erupted from our palms. All I could do was pray Erickson hadn't felt the magic rushing through the house as the rest of the sigils were activated. Frost seeped into the sigil, feeding my magic into the illusion. Briar's spirit and fire summoning did the same to the second sigil. Zack took up his guard post at the door, his magic ready and waiting at his hands in case the plan went south. What are you doing here? Jack shouted. Get the fuck out of my house. I tensed, but shut my eyes and forced myself to remain focused on the illusion. Jack and Chance's lives depended on it. Erickson snapped something back. Then there was more yelling on the Scott brothers' part. This was what was supposed to happen. It was fine. Everything was fine. I fed more magic into the illusion, while downstairs, Erickson ordered Gabriel not to kill Jack and Chance not until she got what she came for. But already I felt the illusion begin to take its toll on me. How long could we keep this illusion going? 
how long before Erickson realized she'd walked into a trap. Chapter 10 Jack Erickson's soldiers flooded into the house. They spread out through the first floor while several took up guard posts at the front door. She wore the same long black jacket she'd had the last time I'd seen her in this very room. Her hair was pulled back in a severe bun. Those damn black boots of hers were too damn shiny, too. She glared from me to chance, and her eyes burned red with her fire. Chance, I thought you and I had an understanding. Chance cowered, then took a step away as if he was ready to run. Did you really think we were that stupid not to know what you were up to? She went on. Though I will admit I hadn't expected you to kill two of Gabriel's men. Bravo for showing you had some spine after all. I wonder, do you still have some left? Leave him alone. I stepped in front of my brother, cutting off her glare. What do you want, huh? Haven't you taken enough from us? Apparently not. Erickson glanced around the living room. It was a nice touch leaving Academy and spreading those rumors you'd gone to the West Coast. Too bad you let slip to the wrong person what you were up to here. I might never have found you. I'd never thought you'd be foolish enough to return home. The flames burned brighter in her eyes while she took in my family home with a hate-filled stare. I knew I should have burned this place to the ground. Perhaps then it would have saved me a second trip. She sighed, then shook her head. You know why I've come. You're going to hand the key piece over to me now. I don't know what you're talking about, I said with a smile of my own. Let's not do this, hm? Erickson snapped her fingers. A gust of wind yanked Chance out from behind me and strayed into Gabriel's grip. He tried to break free, but Erickson produced a flickering red flame in her hand and held it close to his face. Chance stilled immediately, his eyes going wide. In that second, it was impossible to determine if the fear in his gaze was real or faked for Erickson's sake. Tell me where the key piece is hidden, and I won't mutilate your brother's face to match the rest of him, Erickson demanded. I squared my shoulders. No. No, Erickson rolled her eyes. You're going to stand there and let me torture your brother for a second time. I'm not handing over the key piece, no matter what you do. Erickson's fire rose higher, nearly touching Chance's cheek. He reeled back, but Gabriel held him too strong to let him get far. Jack, please, Chance yelled. Just tell her. I can't. Damn it, Jack, please. Chance thrashed in Gabriel's grip. If she gets that piece, she can open the portal, I shouted back. Chance, I'm sorry. Erickson brought the flame even closer. I made it look like I was ready to lunge for her, though I knew that flame wasn't going to hurt Chance. Briar had made sure of it with some help from Zack. The shield protecting my brother was invisible, but damn strong. We'd tested it out on me first. Chance yelled again, cursing and wildly working on getting himself out of Gabriel's grasp. The flame was an inch away from his face, and he blurted, It's in the library! You piece of shit, I shouted, lunging for him. Why would you do that? Gabriel let Chance go, shoving him aside, and snagged me by the throat instead. As good as I felt right then, I nearly attacked him with the full force of my fire summoning. But I had to keep playing like I was weak. That and we were surrounded by Erickson's men. Even if I got off an attack against Gabriel, the rest of them would be on me in a second. He tossed me away, and I made sure to go down hard with a grunt of pain. Chance, Erickson said, smiling sweetly at him. You said the library. Where in the library? I don't know. Jack took it and put it in there somewhere. Chance hung his head, refusing to look at me. I'm sorry. No, you're not, I muttered. You're not sorry for anything, are you? Not really. Jack! Shut up, I yelled. I don't want to hear it. You're weak, Chance. You'll always be weak. Enough, Erickson snapped. Take them both. The rest of you. Search the house. Gabriel grabbed me by the arm and pushed me ahead of him. Walk. I aimed a punch at his face. He easily dodged it and landed one of his own in my gut. I doubled over and felt the first inklings of the familiar ache in my lungs. Shit, the potion was already starting to wear off. 
Turning my back to Gabriel, I swallowed back my worry and started walking. Pathetic. Just like the last time I was here. Gabriel gave me a shove down the hall. I glared at him over my shoulder. Touch me again and I'll burn your fucking face off. <laughs> I'm sure you'll try. Remember how well it went the last time. Gabriel, stop toying with your food. Erickson scolded. Let's get what we came for. Then you can have your fun. I walked quickly to the library, but not for Erickson. We had no real way of knowing how long this illusion of ours would hold up. With so many summoners feeding their magic into it, it was holding well enough. But if we went too long, everyone involved would be weakened. I picked up the pace even more, until finally the double doors to the library were in front of me. I reached for the doors to open them, but Gabriel's boot collided with my back. I careened through them with a curse. The doors crashed into the walls, and I let out a grunt after hitting one of the work tables. With fire in my hand, ready to attack, I whipped around. Erickson set a fiery orb of her own flying straight from my chest, knocking me up and over the table to land in a heap on the floor. Grateful at least that Nyala wasn't able to see this, I climbed to my feet. Grinning, I kept my eyes locked on Erickson. It took everything I had not to look up at the second level and who was hiding in wait. Erickson's brow arched. Behind her, the library doors slammed shut and latched. A webbing of fire and wind-summoning magic etched over and through them, locking them in place. Erickson made no other reaction aside from a single nod. Let me guess. You have a trap set up where the key piece is, hmm? Is that it? She asked. I made sure to make it look as if she'd figured out my plan. I curled my hands into fists and glowered. Yes, well, I won't be walking into that vault, I'm afraid. Fetch the piece. Or what? Gabriel, who'd been standing right beside Chance, snagged my brother by the throat. He unsheathed a knife from his hip and aimed it at my brother's stomach. Gut wounds are the worst. Could take hours for someone to bleed out. Fetch the key piece, or watch Chance die, just as you did with your parents, Erickson warned. Your choice. If they tried to stab Chance, the knife would hit the shield, and they'd know something was up. Backing toward the bookshelf that led to the vault, I gave Chance one last look, silently telling him it was almost over. Then I spun around and ready to open the vault. Steps approached me from behind. Erickson had followed me, though she stayed several yards back, watching me with a cautious eye. Waving my hand over the bookshelf, I unlocked the warding. It flickered to life in bright red and orange flames, then sank into the shelving. The bookshelf slid to the right, revealing the six steps leading down to the vault level. I rushed down them and opened the vault I hadn't even bothered to lock. If Erickson had followed me, I would have had to make it appear as though it had been, but she was too wary of any trap that might be laid for her. Once inside the vault, I picked up the black wooden box. Inside wasn't a piece to the key to Gorgon. Inside was a simple gold coin. There was nothing special about it. Or there hadn't been, until we got our hands on it. Now it looked and felt exactly like the coin that held the creeping death curse. Please let this work, I whispered, unsure of who I was talking to right then. Just let this be over. With the box in hand, I left the vault and met Erickson at the top of the steps. She took the box from me, greedy, a triumphant gleam in her eyes. Reverently, she brushed her fingers over the lid. Then she flipped the lid open and stared. Recognition hit her a second too late. I'd already thrown myself forward, snatched the coin out of the box, and slammed it into her palm. Enjoy the rest of your cursed days, I whispered, then stepped back. For a long, drawn-out three seconds, nothing happened. Erickson started to sigh in relief. Then the coin glowed a deep, burnished glow. Screaming, she clutched a hand to her chest. Gabriel had let Chance go and was yelling while he rushed for Erickson. She hit the floor. Any attempt to let the coin go failed. Come on, come on, I whispered. Do it already. Gabriel spotted the coin and gave me a murderous glare. With knife in hand, he charged for me, leaving Erickson hunched over on the floor. What did you do? He swiped his knife at me, and I jumped back, just missing being slashed across the chest. Chance shouted, and he tackled Gabriel to the side. Get the dagger! 
he yelled at me while he and Gabriel fought over the knife. I jerked my head up, and there was Erickson, holding a very familiar dagger in her left hand. So she hadn't destroyed it after all. I was frozen at that moment, seeing that our long shot had paid off. She raised it toward her own chest, ready to lift a curse that hadn't even been placed on her. A coil of rope made of fire fell from my hand. I drew it back, then used it like a whip. It wrapped around the dagger of vitality's hilt. One hard yank, and the dagger was torn away from Erickson and slammed into my waiting palm. Now! I bellowed. The floor trembled, and the wind gusted around the library. The shimmering light of spirit energy appeared in the wind. Erickson's face scrunched in confusion until she became trapped in a cage comprised of the three elements. Ice joined it, solidifying the bars with the earth that had been dragged up from beneath the library floor. Gabriel tried to run, but a rocky arm of earth caught him around the middle, slammed him to the floor, and trapped him within a second cage. Steps sounded on the metal spiral staircases, while Nick, Luke, and Adam descended from the second story. The illusion was broken, and now, the yells of Erickson's men facing down an army of talons were audible from the other side of the library doors. What the hell is this? Erickson shouted. Piss? His eyes narrowed in fury. Adam stalked toward her cage. His brothers flanking him wore the same look, and I noted how glad I was to be on their side in this fight. General Elena Erickson, you are hereby arrested along with your men. You will be escorted back to Talon HQ, where there are some interested parties waiting to question your activities of late, including the murders of Jenny and Clark Scott. Those were words I'd never thought I'd hear. Across the library, Chance doubled over, leaning heavily on a table. He swiped at his eyes, but there was a smile on his face. There'd be time to celebrate once this was all over. The library doors opened. Nyala led the way inside, with Briar and Zack right behind her. Our eyes locked, and she sprinted right into my waiting arms. Are you all right? She checked me over, then spotted the dagger in my hand. You got it. I got it. I held up the dagger of vitality, the real one this time, and couldn't stop the smile that spread across my face. Not about to wait another second to be free of the curse, I turned it, aiming it toward my chest. You think you've won, is that it? Erickson snapped. Ignoring her, I used my summoning to ignite the power inside the dagger. It hummed in my grip. Doing as I did before, I prepared to press the tip of the blade to my chest. An inch away, the blade was torn from my grasp. It ended up in Erickson's hand. The cage around her crumbled to dust. Adam and his brothers took a step back in confusion. I pushed Nyala behind me, unsure what I was even seeing. How much power had she stolen to be this strong? How are we going to stop her? Erickson sneered. Did you think I've come this far to be taken down by the likes of you? She snapped her fingers, and the cage containing Gabriel fell apart too. Shouts came from outside the house. There was a loud crash, then panicked yells echoed around the halls. Always bring more men than you think you'll need, Erickson commented. Now then, how about we finish this for good, hmm? A massive hand of fire erupted from her palm and sent Adam, Luke, and Nick flying out the library doors. A second swipe, and Briar and Zag joined them. She waved her hand, and a wall of fire covered the library doors, sealing them shut. I should have killed you both that night, Erickson snapped, glaring at Chance and me. Now, at least, I can take one last thing from you before I end your life. An explosion of fire shot out of Erickson, aimed straight for Nyala. It met a wall of my own fire, but Erickson was strong and the potion I'd taken was wearing off fast. I was weakening by the second. Just as my wall was about to give way, a frigid blast of ice shot past me and right through the flames. Erickson shouted. She crashed into the wall of shelves, taking them all to the floor with her. On the other side of the library, Gabriel and Chance fought. Wind whipped around the room, picking up anything too light to stay down while they went after each other. Willing my brother to hold his own for a few seconds, I rushed to Nyala's side. She took hold of my hand. Her glare turned on Erickson struggling to get to her feet. Joining our summoning as we'd done at Academy, 
Nyala and I held up our joined hands. A swirling storm of ice and fire burst into being before us. The silver burned red from the inside. It grew larger, twisting in on itself and shrieking with our combined anger. We unleashed it on Erickson. She threw her hand up, and the storm we created bashed into her wall of fire. But she wasn't going to be able to hold out for long. Already the strain was getting to her. Her arm trembled, and her boots slid across the floor until she was pressed into the wall. The ice and fire began to form bars of a new cage. Panic burned in Erickson's eyes. We could do this. We could end— Chance's yell came a second before he was tossed across the room, bashing his head against the wall. He collapsed to the floor and didn't get up again. I yelled his name, then Nyala screamed. A gust of wind wrapped around her and tore her away from me. The storm we'd manifested disintegrated. I shouted, but Gabriel had that damn knife of his to Nyala's throat. One move and she's dead. This was my nightmare. No, worse than my nightmare. Gabriel sneered, pushing the edge of his blade against Nyala's throat. You should have let the curse kill you and be done with it. Now you'll get to watch another person you love die. Flames burned in my palms. She has nothing to do with this. Ah, but you love her, and that means watching her die will finally break you. Nyala's eyes glimmered with cold fury. I slid my eyes to the left. Chance was still lying on the floor, unconscious from the hit he'd taken to the head. Or I thought he was. Did his hand just twitch? Jack? Nyala said, pulling my attention to her. I'm sorry, I whispered. I never meant for any of this to happen. I'm not sorry, she said, then gave me the slightest of nods. I love you. Oh, shut up with the sappy shit, Gabriel snarled. Erickson, you alive or what? Burn it down, Erickson yelled. I'm going to burn all of this to the ground with all of you in it. No one will ever find your bones. No one, you hear me? She stomped toward me, the dagger of vitality still clutched in her fist. I'll get the key to Gorgren, and I will take what's... Chance flung himself at Erickson, bringing with him the force of a cyclone at his back. Gabriel turned his attention to watch them. Nyala's hands became covered in a thick layer of frost. She reached for the dagger, shoving it away from her throat and ducking out of his grasp. He shouted, going after her, but I sent a fiery songbird slamming into his chest, knocking him back. That was all I could manage. A rush of dizziness hit me a second later. The sensation of a thousand knives stabbing at my lungs struck me next. The full weight of the curse was ready to fall on me while the potion wore off. Nyala and Gabriel were fighting over the knife. She sent a blast of ice flying at him, driving him up into the air. Chance was struggling with Erickson on the floor. I had to help them, but my legs were too heavy to move. Breathing became impossible. I sucked in air, feeling my body betraying me. This was it. This was how it'd end. I'd die knowing that Chance and Nyala were probably about to join me. Jack! Chance shouted while Erickson screamed at him. I glanced up, spotting the dagger sailing through the air. I snatched it before it could hit the floor. While Erickson readied her next attack to end me, I turned the dagger around and pressed the tip to my chest. An intense wave of energy shot into me with so much force it lifted me off the floor. I waited for it to throw me across the room, but I hung there, suspended instead. The weakness and pain I'd become so used to feeling were peeled away layer by layer as that revitalizing wave tore through me with a vengeance. The curse fought back, screaming inside me, and tried to hold on even tighter to my soul. The dagger's humming turned into a booming melody that shook the walls of the house. Another pulse of what had to be pure, life-giving magic burned away the last of the curse. Gently the magic of the dagger lowered me to my feet. The blade went silent in my hand. I lowered my arm and raised my head. Across the library, Erickson glared back at me. You think you're strong enough to take me on now, is that it? She yelled. You're nothing, you hear me. None of you will ever be enough. Maybe not alone, I admitted, relief rushing through me at how easily my fire came to my call. It filled my palm and coiled up my arm, and there was no pain anywhere in my body. 
I took a deep breath in and let it out, fully revived. But I'm not alone. Chan stepped in from Erickson's right, the wind rustling his hair while it awaited his command. A brush of cold air came from my back. Then Nyala stepped into view on my left. Ice covered every inch of her in harsh, jagged patterns. Gabriel? I asked. Nyala's lip twitched. He's hanging around. I glanced up, laughing at the sight of the man pinned to the ceiling by thick spears of ice jutting through his clothing. More was snaked across his chest like iron bands. His head was hanging, telling me he was unconscious. And Nyala had once thought herself powerless. I doubted she'd ever think that again. The three of us moved in closer. Erickson readied her fire in her hands, her eyes wild while they danced from one to the other. She opened her mouth, probably ready to curse us out some more. Then the doors exploded open. The full might of the Pierce brothers rushed Erickson, subduing her in seconds. Beyond the doors were more talons. Most sported some sort of injury. From the satisfied looks on their faces, I sensed no one of their numbers had been killed at least. When Erickson continued to yell, her arms trapped in spirit energy manacles, I strolled up to her, grinned, and punched her hard enough to knock her out. It was over. Finally, it was all over. Jack, Nyala said, and I spun around to face her. We ran toward each other, and I picked her up off her feet, spun her around, and then kissed her. Did you? I mean, is it gone? The curse? It's gone. I kissed her again. I guess you're stuck with me for a while longer. She squeezed me back so hard it hurt, but I didn't care. I didn't care about much right then. I kept expecting this to be a dream, but I never woke up. The pain never returned. There was no curse. Not anymore. Briar let out a loud whistle. Damn, Nyala, how the hell did you manage to get him all the way up there? He pissed me off, Nyala said with a shrug, and I laughed. Chance walked over to join us, a strange look on his face. Are you all right? I asked him. I just... I never thought it'd end, he whispered. We did it. Yeah, we did, I said, my stomach twisting in knots at how close we'd come to not pulling this off. But we had. And now I had a life to plan. There'd be some work ahead of us, I was sure of it. Adam would need more information regarding Gabriel and Erickson. I was more than willing to help him dismantle their network. Eventually, I also planned on starting my graduate years the right way. And Chance would need more time to heal and figure out what he was going to do with this life. Right then, all I wanted to do was watch the sun come up, knowing there were many more sunrises and sunsets in my future. Nyala rested her head on my shoulder. So, she mused. So, I repeated. What do we do now? I vote we sleep for a few days, uh, then another few days. Then I'm going to take you on vacation. I don't know where, but it'll be nice and relaxing and peaceful. How does that sound? She turned her face toward me. Sounds good to me. I kissed her, and we laughed at the eruption of catcalls coming from Chance and Briar. It would have been better to have Mom and Dad standing there with us in the end. But somehow, I knew they weren't far away. Hand in hand, Nyala and I followed the others out of the library and took our first steps to a much brighter life. Chapter 11 Nyala Six Months Later I stood outside Headmaster Hook's door for a solid minute, wondering what he needed to talk to me about. It was the first week of the fall semester. I was signed up to repeat the classes I'd meant to take in the spring. After everything that had happened with Jack, Chance, and the assholes who tried to kill us, I'd taken Jack up on his offer for a vacation. Time off had been just what I'd needed. Jack, too, for that matter. It gave us time not only to deal with what we'd gone through, but for him to really take back his family's home. Jack was the happiest I'd seen him. The curse was gone, he had his brother back, and his home was filled with laughter and love instead of just grief. And from what I'd overheard him talking to Chance about one night, there was something else he had planned. I did my best to smother my excitement. It was getting harder to do by the day. I didn't want to let him know that I knew, 
seeing as I had no idea when he planned to ask what he'd apparently wanted to ask me all summer long. This semester was a fresh start for him. He was finally getting his graduate program and would only be a year behind me. After academy, well, we just have to see where life took us. Smoothing my hands down my bright purple sundress and reminding myself there was no way I could be in trouble with Hook yet, I pushed open the office door. I wondered how long you were going to stand out there, he said by way of a greeting. He set down the letter he'd been reading and stood up with a laugh. Were you that worried? You never know. He grinned along with me and motioned to the two chairs in front of his desk. We sat down and he folded his hands atop the desk. Now, I know you're already going to be quite busy this semester. However, there is something I'd hope to see your name put down for, but wasn't. Oh? Mentoring. I cringed. Are you really sure I'd be the best mentor? He barked a laugh. You were a mentor for Briar, were you not? At least when Zack wasn't able to get through to her. And I do believe you also just spent the last year helping Jack. You're a natural, I think. If you really want me to be one, I wouldn't mind. I leaned back in the chair, noting the slightly tensed set to Hook's shoulders. Why do I get the feeling you're not just going to randomly pair me with a student? There is someone I had in mind. She'll be arriving a week after orientation, Hook said. Her parents work for the government and have been abroad for the last two years. Their daughter, Megan, will simply need some extra guidance in the beginning. It's been years since she's had any formal school setting. I thought that you would be the best one to help her get settled in. Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem at all. Just let me know when she arrives. Excellent. Hook asked me a few more questions about my semester and how I was feeling about my classes. It was a much less stressful conversation than I'd anticipated it to be. By the time I left his office, Jack had texted me, asking if I was able to meet him, Briar, and Zack in the dining hall for dinner. Tomorrow, orientation week officially kicked off. We had a few more days of relaxing. Then the hard work would start all over again. I entered the hall, easily finding the table in the corner where Jack and the others waited for me. Hey, I said, sitting down beside him. So what did Hook want? Briar asked. Nothing much. He wants me to be a mentor this year for a new student. She's not getting here until after orientation week. See, I told you it was nothing. Zack commented. It sounded more serious, Briar replied. If it was you he'd called in to speak with, it probably would have been. Zack beamed at Briar. A second later, he was cursing and stomping his feet. Damn it, woman. Briar cackled until Zack leaned over and cut her off with a kiss. I shook my head at their antics and turned to Jack. Are you ready to officially start your graduate-level classes? He draped his arm over my shoulders. I'm ready for a nice, quiet year. Wouldn't that be nice? I leaned into him, smiling after he kissed the top of my head. Have you heard from Chance? Yeah, he's fitting in great with the Pierce brothers. I was worried for him at first, but he sounded genuinely happy on the phone. I think with enough training, he's going to make an excellent talent one day. It was nice to hear Chance was doing all right. I was sure he'd still have his bad days. We all would. But he'd be well looked after where he was. At least between the information gathered by Jack and Chance, Adam could finally make headway into a full-scale investigation involving anything to do with General Elena Erickson. They were still dismantling her network, and last I'd heard, they'd been clearing out more rooms filled with stolen artifacts they'd found hidden in tunnels beneath her mansion. There'd also been an entire room dedicated to her plans involving the Key of Gorgren. That had been the nail in her coffin. Are you two ready for this fall? I asked Briar and Zack. I am. I'm still not sure Bra is the best person to have around new students. Zack teased with a wink. She might end up setting all their feet on fire. I see nothing wrong with that. Oh, I can't wait to see how these first few weeks go, I said. I chuckled while Briar and Zack bantered back and forth. They were spending this semester mentoring and teaching practical application lessons for spirit and fire summoning. I wasn't really worried about them, though Briar's temper could end up getting the best of her. Her students were certainly going to be damn good at summoning. That I had no doubts about. And you're all good? Jack asked. I nearly blurted out the question that had been nagging at me for days, but managed a nod instead. Perfect. 
Yeah? There's nothing else on your mind? Nope. Not a thing. Huh. Because I could have sworn there was something else, seeing as you'd been so anxious these last few days. His eyes danced with fire. A matching flame slipped from his palm, coiled around his arm, and eased its way across my shoulders. When it ribboned around my arm and reached my hands, my lips parted on a question. The flame shifted to my left ring finger. It formed a circle and stayed there. Briar smacked Zack on the shoulder, gasping and pointing at my left hand. Jack, I breathed while my heart did somersaults. Are you? I mean, is this... Not that I'm saying it should be, but I wouldn't complain either. It's just... His kiss stopped me from rambling on any longer. I sank into his warmth, grinning while his arms wrapped around me, holding me in a bear hug while he continued to kiss me until I was dizzy. I haven't found the ring yet, but I didn't want to keep you waiting. And I know this is right. I want to be with you if you want to be with me, he whispered against my lips. Marry me? I captured his mouth in another kiss that nearly knocked us both off the bench. I'll take that as a yes, he said through his laughter. Zack let out a shout and clapped while Briar wiped a tear from her eye. Everyone in the hall was staring at us, and I couldn't have cared less. This was the happy ending I'd been waiting for, and I couldn't wait to see what came after. The End this has been Legacy Next Generation, Academy of Ancients, Book 8, written by Avery Cross, narrated by Jack Ainsworth, copyright 2023 by Avery Cross, production copyright by Avery Cross.